All right, good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the Sterling Heights City Council to order. Please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dear God, please bless our elected officials, grant them courage and wisdom to do what is right for all citizens. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Barra, can we please have the roll call? Mayor Taylor. Here. Mrs. Sarowski. Here. Mrs. Koski. Present. Mr. Radke. Present. Mrs. Schmidt. Present. Mr. Yanez. Here. Mrs. Zyarko. Present. Thank you, Council. We need approval of the agenda. Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Koski. Move to approve the agenda. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. I would like to uh, move item E and item H off the consent agenda and make them in order a consideration item 9B and 9C. Okay, so we'll have um, consent item E, which is 8E, become 9B, and 8H will become 9C. Anyone else? No further discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. First item on our agenda tonight is a report from our city manager, Mark Vanderpool. Mr. Vanderpool. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to begin with a special presentation this evening. And just by way of introduction, everyone's aware that we have an adopt a road program in the city. It's been a long standing program, and we have uh, many participants who adopt roads and help clean them up twice a year. And, and take good care of them. And over the last uh, year, we've been working on enhancing that program with some new signage and with some additional tiers that may be applicable to businesses uh, to help us reforest some of our rights of way and medians uh, through a sponsorship. So this evening, I'm really pleased to introduce our communications coordinator, Marissa Russo, who's been leading this uh, effort over the past year, and she's gonna tell us uh, all about the new ideas that we have in mind. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council, Mr. Vanderpool, and um, actually not Mr. Kaczewski tonight. Um, I do apologize, but City Attorney. Um, I am excited to share with you our latest initiative, uh, the Inspiring Green Project, which builds upon the sustainable efforts we've been leading as part of the Think Drilling Green umbrella brand. Last April, the city launched Sing Sterling Green to showcase the city's commitment, uh, creating a better community through sustainable practices. And the Inspiring Green Project is an exciting addition to our sustainable efforts, offering residents, businesses, and community members an opportunity to actively engage in creating a greener community. This program uh, was initially an opportunity to take a deeper look into our Adopt a Road program and establish a stronger relationship with our committed members and help us enhance our original goal to keep roadsides clean and attractive. Through this revamped program, we invite everyone to become an ambassador for sustainability and to embrace the philosophy of thinking Sterling Green. Uh, our tiered partnership levels within the Inspiring Green Project ensure that there are opportunities for everyone to get involved regardless of their background or resources. Whether it's through supporting green infrastructure projects, participating in community events, or spreading awareness about sustainable practices, there's a role for everyone to play in making our community more environmentally friendly. Uh, as you see on the screen, the Inspiring Green Ambassador is similar to our Adopt a Road. Um, ambassador is in some ways our entry level um, into our Inspiring Green project and a perfect opportunity for individuals and local groups to get involved and help spread awareness for a greener, cleaner community. I see our Inspiring Green ambassadors being very influential to our sustainable initiatives and helping move the city forward. As you see uh, on this slide, we offer our Inspiring Green partnerships, which are three tiers at different um, vantage points. And so, um, we will now also be offering opportunities for community members to provide a greater impact on our ecosystem and help increase our quality of life through sponsorship. Um, we hope to invite these key stakeholders and others to partner and support the improvements of green infrastructure in our community. Through the higher tier levels, the partners will receive promotion and marketing as partners in our projects through digital, print, and multimedia efforts, as well as newly designed signage on their sponsored roadway. 
So as you can see on this slide, it gives you a preview of the Inspire partnership uh, signage that we will implement if somebody was to partner with us through this initiative. Um, the signage designed for Inspire partners, uh, along with the many opportunities that are included in this tier. So um, there's a list of different types of opportunities um, also included is planting up to 75 to 80 trees, um, social media posts, city newsletter, and a lot of um, great opportunities to get recognized throughout our community. Uh, the city has taken steps to revitalize the Adopt Road program, reaching out to all ex existing adopters to share our exciting rebrand and ambassador opportunities. Additionally, we are working towards replacing the many signs throughout the city with the new vibrant signage to amplify the visibility and impact of the program. The launch of the Inspiring Green project marks another milestone in our journey towards a more sustainable future. By inviting residents, businesses, and community members to join us in thinking Sterling Green, we can collectively make a meaningful impact on our environment and create a better community for generations to come. Thank you for your ongoing support as we continue to lead the way in sustainable initiatives and projects. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. Yeah, Mayor and Council, I just wanted to highlight that uh, the ambassador level is the current adopt a road program. So a business or a group of individuals or an ad individual does not have to uh, contribute the tiers that were mentioned to be part of the ambassador program. But the signage is being rebranded under this uh, new identity, if you will. Now you might ask, uh, are businesses really going to be interested in this? And that's why we developed the three tiers. Uh, smaller businesses may not be interested in the Inspire $30,000 tier or even the 10,000, but they may be interested in the 5,000. So we had Dodge Park Coney Island on there, not to put any pressure on the owner. Hmm. And we met with the owner of Dodge Park Coney Island uh, to see if he might be interested. And, and he may very well be interested in the, the lead tier especially knowing that there is some benefit for businesses uh, with this program as well. They certainly get exposure um, and also contribute to, uh, to uh, tree planting, reforestation, and so on in the cities. In addition to Dodge Park Coney Island, we've had discussions with AGS, and they're interested in either the $10,000 or $30,000 tier. In fact, we have an upcoming meeting with them in a couple weeks to solidify these. Uh, so... Uh, we hope that once we get a couple of these out in the community at the at the higher tiers that other major corporations in the city will take note and recognize the value of uh, being part of this program. Uh, the signage, uh, you're, you're seeing it already pop up on uh, Dodge Park Road, for example. Dodge Park Coney Island is under the ambassador tier, so they do have the new signage up. Again, we hope to get them to the next tier. And, and you'll be seeing the other adopt -a road signage throughout the city replaced with this new brand over the summer months. So I just wanted to uh, uh, thank Marissa and the community relations team and uh, Scott uh, Sharon in engineering who's worked really hard on this program and we're excited to uh, get it fully rolled out. Thank you. And Mayor, continuing on that theme and talking about beautifying the community and and cleaning up areas. Uh, you may know we have our upcoming Shine program that's on May 4th. Uh, that's the Sterling Heights Initiative for Neighborhood Excellence. It's where we go out and clean up a number of homes. Uh, council members uh, have participated in that in the past and I enjoy participating. It's fun to get together with volunteers and help uh, individuals in need who just aren't able to clean up their property for spring cleaning. And that includes uh, mowing grass, trimming bushes, raking leaves, getting landscape, landscape beds turned over and so on. That's on May 4th. And we're always looking for volunteers. We need about 75 volunteers or so. So if any of you are interested or your kids uh, may be interested, please have them call community relations and we'll get them signed up. Only requires a few hours of effort on a Saturday morning, May 4th. And by one o'clock or so, we're all done. And speaking of uh, cleanup days, uh, we have our very popular uh, DPW uh, cleanup days coming up on April 3rd will be our shed shred day. Uh, so you can bring your uh, paper that's stored in banker boxes or what have you to DPW and, and actually watch uh, the documents being shredded on site. That's April 13th, always very popular. 
And also our household hazardous waste event will be on April 20th. Uh, that too is very popular. You can go to our website to identify all the material that you can bring there. This is material that you can't set out for normal collection at curbside, but you can bring it to DPW and uh, they will uh, dispose of it properly. And then on April 27th, we have our electronics recycling day for those who want to get rid of uh, computer monitors and TVs and dispose of them and recycle them in the proper way. On uh, April 27th, you can bring those uh, items to DPW as well. And then in May, on May 11th and the 18th, uh, those are cleanup days where you can bring basically any other material, DPW. Uh, it could be woody debris, it could be uh, gravel, it could be other things that you're cleaning up from your landscape beds that you don't set out for um, a yard waste collection. You can bring it to DPW and dispose of it on May 11th and the 18th. So these are great programs and help get our community looking great for the spring and summer months. And all of this uh, plays a role in keeping our uh, neighborhoods aesthetically pleasing, our homes in good shape, cleaned up, and most importantly, property values high, which is a, a major objective of all these programs as well. And Mayor, that concludes my report this evening. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Vanderpool. The next item on our agenda is to is an ordinance introduction, and this is to consider introduction of an ordinance to regulate pneumatic guns as permitted by state law. We have a presentation from our Assistant City Attorney, Nathan Petruzic, uh, and Captain Ken Pappas from the Sterling Heights Police Department. Gentlemen. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. Uh, what you have before you this evening is an, the introduction of an ordinance to regulate pneumatic guns in the city of Sterling Heights. Um, some years ago, it used to be that the state uh, pretty much occupied the field of regulation in terms of pneumatic guns, including BB guns, paintball guns, and things of that, things of that sort. Uh, that changed a number of years ago, I believe it was 2015, and since that time, a number of municipalities have begun enacting regulations within their city uh, to regulate the possession and use of pneumatic guns uh, in a manner that is commensurate with what the, the particular municipality is looking to accomplish, giving its local concerns and its local needs. Uh, the, the ordinance uh, before you this evening does a number of different things with respect to pneumatic guns. It prohibits persons who are under the age of 16 years old from possessing a pneumatic gun unless they're under the supervision of an adult. It prohibits uh, persons from pointing, waving about, or displaying a pneumatic gun in a manner that is intended to threaten or induce fear in another individual. Um, it prohibits the discharge of a pneumatic gun on property adjoining another property that is utilized uh, or zoned for overnight habitation. That's not to say that uh, the prop you cannot fire a be a pneumatic gun on that particular property. You just have to take reasonable safeguards to put it to erect barriers that prevent the BB from leaving that property and going on to adjacent properties. Um, the obvious reasons for uh, an ordinance like this is there's very real public safety concerns uh, related to uh, pneumatic guns, obviously because they appear uh, similar in many respects to uh, actual firearms. This ordinance also, I would note, uh, provides that uh, you're not allowed to modify a pneumatic gun so that it looks like an actual firearm. Uh, the, and uh, there are also concerns related to uh, pneumatic guns being used to harm animals um, and the uh, damage to property as well as to intimidate others, such as in road rage incidents. Um, other than that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have this evening, and I will turn it over to Captain Pappas if he has anything else he would like to add. We just had uh, some complaints of um, the using of uh, BB guns in the neighborhoods. Um, children shooting at houses with the paintball guns, and when school starts to let out, we get an influx of calls for the mischief of those type of weapons. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, so, to those who couldn't hear, you just said we, we've gotten a lot of calls. Uh, there have been kids who have been shooting paintball guns and, and other BB guns, and so this is... Um, this is what's going on. I know some people had difficulty hearing. So, um, 
All right, thank you. Is there anyone in the audience? So we'll call you back up if we have any questions. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on this item? If not, council, we need a motion. Mr. Mayor. Okay. Mr. Yanez. A result to introduce the ordinance to regulate pneumatic guns as permitted by state law. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? Um, I think this is, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I think this is a really good idea, especially um, since it's sort of been kicked down to the municipal level. Uh, it was just a few years ago that it made national news that uh, people were driving ar around different cities just randomly shooting people with paint paintball guns. And I guess they thought because they were only paintball guns, they were safe. But, you know, paintball guns hurt. Uh, especially if you get hit in the in the eye or what have you, um, they can be very dangerous as well as pellet guns or BB guns. So uh, I think this is a very good idea, and I fully support it. Okay, council. Anyone else? Mayor Taylor. This is Sarowski. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. I just do want to weigh in on this as a mother of four boys who, when vacuuming my house for the last five years, I ha every day I vacuumed their rooms. I would get zzz, 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 zzz in my vacuum because I was picking up paintball or. Pit, uh, Airsoft <laughs> pellets. Um, yeah, we had a lot of airsoft guns in my life, and I think my son still has a whole collection underneath his uh, bed, the last one at the house. So, yes, it is fun for them. They loved it. My two older ones own guns, and one is a Marine, so obviously loves guns. Um, and... It is important, though, to make sure that we they are regulated appropriately. And it's sad in our in our backup material. It was mentioned that a couple of young men in this particular instance uh, have been shot because they have been thought they they were brandishing guns, and it was actually airsoft guns. So um, we do want to make sure that people understand that this can be a very serious issue. And we I just I think that having the right regulations and ordinances will help us to make sure that people do understand what they have is still serious and need to be treated with the appropriate respect and responsibility. So yes, I heard the respect out in the audience. So that is very true. So thank you. And that's all I have. Okay. Council, anyone else? Ms. Yeah. Mrs. Koski. I would just like to add that this gives our police department another tool to help keep our residents safe. So thank you, Mr. Pappas. I should say, Captain Baptist. Mm -hmm. Council, Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through the chair to Mr. Petruzak, I just have one brief question. Reviewing the packet that we were given, on page 14 of the total packet, it says, and I'm reading the bullet point, prohibit the discharge of a pneumatic gun on any property adjoining another property utilized or zoned for overnight habitation, a property where people live or stay, or adjoining property utilized or designed for public recreation, there's some exceptions there. I just wanted to clarify that point. It's uh, in uh, the, the third bullet point under item number three. And uh, just to be clear, people can fire airsoft guns on their own property. They don't need permission of their neighbors to use an airsoft gun on their own property. They just need permission of their neighbors if the airsoft gun pellet would cross property lines. Is that my understanding? Thank you for the question, Councilman Radke. And could you speak into the microphone because the people in the back are a little quiet. Apologies. Sure. Uh, the, you're, you are mostly correct in that. It is, it is correct to say that um, you're not prohibited from shooting a pneumatic gun on your own property. You don't need anyone's permission in terms of adjacent property owners to allow you to do that. You obviously need the permission of the property owner that correct. you're going to be shooting it on. Uh, but all that what is required is that you in, take reasonable care under the ordinance to make sure that, that that BB, that pellet, does not leave the property that you're shooting it on. And that generally means to erect some type of barrier to prevent that. A from fence happening. or something that, a backstop of some sort. Correct. Okay. Uh, the, the only reason I ask that is as someone who had a BB gun as a kid, who fired his BB gun on his own property, I wouldn't want other children not to have this ability. Uh, I understand all the reasons why we want to make sure we keep the public safe, but I also don't want to take a a recreation opportunity away from children who mostly are doing the right thing. We have some complaints, but I would say that we don't have an overwhelming number. So I want to make sure that that's clear. But I have no problems if that is the case. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Radke. Mr. Schmidt. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Through the chair to Mr. Petruzic. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> could you explain what the consequences to a minor who possesses not on their own property or not with, with an adult, what their consequence would be if they're found in possession? 
the consequence to a person who is under the age of 16 who was found to be in possession of a pneumatic gun, it is a civil infraction, and that is by state law. And how about between 16 and 18? Uh, between 16 and 18, if they engage in a violation of this particular ordinance, uh, except for one provision of it, it is a misdemeanor offense that is punishable by uh, nine, uh, 90 days in jail and or up to a uh, $500 fine. Okay, um, thank you. I would like to recommend and strongly suggest that, I know we have resource officers in all of our high schools. However, if we do pass this ordinance, I think both school districts, administration, and principals at all three of those high schools and the middle schools should receive copies of this. Um, and hopefully they would um, pass that information on to their parents. Mm -hmm. So I have nothing further. Thank you, Mrs. Schmidt. Anyone else? Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to support this as well. Um, I think it was a, a good idea. I think Ms. Kosky brought this up some time ago, and uh, I think um, I'm happy to support it. Um, I had a, my brother, probably 25 years ago, my brother was shot by a BB gun in the face, and uh, the BB got stuck in his chin, and it was, like, lodged in there. It actually lodged in there for weeks, maybe months, and, and it just sort of grew around it. And his friend was just goofing around. They were, you know, maybe... 12, 13, 14 years old, and um, the friend shot, was trying to shoot at his foot or something. I don't know. Not that that would, I guess that's better. Um, so, yeah, kids play around with these things. I think it's a good idea to have, um, to, to have this, these age uh, requirements in there. So uh, hopefully this will help prevent any, uh, any sort of tragedy. So I will support it. So council with no further discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, next item on our agenda is an ordinance adoption, and this is to consider adoption of an ordinance amending Chapter 23 of the City Code entitled Garbage and Refuse to Establish New Regulations for Curbside Collection of Refuse, Recycling, and Yard Waste. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on this item? Mr. Marshall owns. View, sir, if you want to speak, just raise your hand to let me know, okay? Because you just sort of, usually you just, you just make your way up there, okay? <laughs> All right, come on up, Mr. Marshall Owens. <laughs> Hold on to your timer. <laughs> oh, man, I should have called him. <laughs> Where'd he go? Where's he going? All right, is there anyone else that wants to come on up, sir? I mean, oh, he's, he's oh, getting wait, something. He's getting... Oh, he has a prop. You got a, got a prop. garbage can. <laughs> uh oh. You know, I've, I've heard all about all of this uh, nonsense about these humongous cans that people are going to be dragging around. <clears throat> Unfortunately, people can't always drag those around. And 60% of the homes in Sterling Heights are smaller than 1,800 square feet. They have smaller garages, two car, not two and a half or three like in the northern part of the city. But they can't, there's no place to put garbage cans. Okay? Now this is my garbage can. I, I bought this in 2005 when I retired. Okay? It is still immaculate inside. <laughs> Can see this? Well, 2005. Because I keep a bag in here like this. And in the summertime, I put this out by the side of the house because they attract insects, mm -hmm. not rats. We don't have rat problems in Sterling Heights. I can tell we live right on the drain and we don't have rat problems. Now, the biggest problem is in the wintertime. I take these, and you know at the back of your garage, you have a rise about so big. I put two of these up there, and as an 83-year-old person, I don't have to risk walking out on ice and snow to put my garbage in the side of my house somewhere, or prying off a lid that's frozen down. At the same rate, we come up with a some genius came up with a real piece of wisdom. The city will buy garbage cans for everybody. I'm going to put in a request 
under the Freedom of Information Act, I want to know exactly how much it's going to cost the city to buy and distribute all those garbage cans. And I am going to keep pushing and pushing because too many older people can't handle those big things. You can't push them down your driveway when they got ice on it. <clears throat> now what I do, I take this when it's full on Monday, tie the top and take it down and put it on the street. We don't have any insects, rats, nobody messes with it. And it doesn't cost the city anything. It doesn't eat up our tax money. So we're going to keep pushing on this stuff. We're going to, and, and, I'll, and additionally, I find that the, we're going to wind up with automatic trucks and only one operator instead of two. But yet the price of collecting the garbage is going to go up. That's like if I have two cars, it's cheaper than one. I don't know where all this wisdom comes from, but I'd certainly like to find out. So my telephone number is area code 586-549-3778. Anyone that wants to join me in this, just give me a call. Anyone that's got any real reason why we're doing this nonsense, give me a call, because I'd just like to find out what it is. Okay? That's it. That's, I've got a lot of other things, but we only get four minutes, which is a violation of my right to freedom of speech. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Marshallones. Is it Mr. Mr. Rath Rathel? By the way, you can see out there how nice and clean you're going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mike Gretel, 488-515 Mile Road. Okay, camera. <coughs> it's there. Okay, all right, see this? I don't know why. Center it a little bit more. Up. Move it up a little higher on the table. Right there? Yeah, that's fine. How's that? Yeah, you can see it. See, it's up there now. Oh, okay. Yeah, now you could, that's a normal trash takeout. I don't know what the problem is in that. And I, here's another can. I don't know higher. when you guys sold them cans. It's got your sterling ice to get. You got to move it up higher. Higher? Take look a look at, look at, at the, the Oh, right where the, the light is. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, here's another can. I don't know. What, that's a good can, but it's got a sticker on it. I don't know why. I didn't get out to read the sticker. But that's it. I don't know where you bought these at. That's another price. Now I can see why that's a mess. I don't know if they got evicted or what. I don't know. But that that's so-so. It could be straightened up a little better than that. Here's a mattress. I don't know why they didn't pick that up. So there's a problem. Okay, this new company, if you got that out there, are they going to pay for, or do they going to call a separate truck, or do you got to call a separate truck? Are they going to charge you for this, or no? That's what I like to know. And here's another one with a sticker, and I read that one, it was too heavy, overweight. And it's got one of the, it's a Sterling Knights, it's got the little bracket where they can put it in the truck, I don't know why they didn't take that. Here's another one I took. Another cabinet. They didn't throw it in there. I don't understand why. And here's another pile. See, now all this is going to be extra, I think. I don't know if you're going to have to be paid for this or they're going to call a separate truck or what. Here's another one. They got the can, but they got something on the side. Now, in your rules, they're not going to pick that up. If we had that special can... They'll pick that up. Now here, this is a glass one. Look at that, baby. There goes your mattress. Garbage truck. So, I don't understand. This is, it's going to be, it's going to be crazy. I swear to God. Here's another mattress. They're loading it up. They're crunching it. And here's one here. They are using the container. 
But look at that, how that thing's bulging out. They just load it up and take it away. And here it is, load it up and take it away. Okay, another thing. I want to know, how many years is this? What's the contract? I want to know what the contract is in a four-year ride, five-year ride, what's going on. And uh, I, they're not taking this to the landfill. I think they're taking it to stub substations, right? I, it's it's going to cost more money going to substation than another truck's got to take it to the landfill. But I like to know how much did you spend on these cans? Because I don't know, it's it's not right. I don't know. And can I say one thing? Hey, Frank, the chicken was good. Thanks. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anybody else on this item? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yesterday, on their instructions, you're not supposed to put those containers near the mailbox. They drop those containers right by my mailbox. I can't haul them up to my garage with my walker. I can't haul them down to my garage with my walker. There's four people in my subdivision that the cans are still sitting there. Now, by tomorrow, are we going to get fined by our association because we have cans sitting in our driveway that aren't supposed to be there? And I've had three of my cousins that are my age that are saying, what are we going to do? How are we going to get those down to the, the, the drive? How are we going to get those up? And I hear when they're full, they're heavy. I've called the uh, priority three times or four times a day. I called the city hall three times a day, and they kept bouncing me back and forth. It's not our problem. It's priority's problem. I called priority. They said it's not our fault. It's the city's problem. I left a message on Dina's voicemail, and I didn't get a return call. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do about getting those cans off my driveway and what I'll do. There's no way. And somebody at the city hall, I think it was, said to me, well, how do you get your garbage out now? Very snotty. And I said, I take the bags, I hang them from my walker, and I take them down. I can't take those containers down. I don't think this was thought out very clearly. To me, there's got to be a lot more handicapped <coughs> and older people in Sterling Heights that this is going to be an issue for. I thank you for your time. All right, thank you, ma'am. Um, anyone else on this item? Not, Council, we need a motion. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Zarko. Resolve to adopt the ordinance amending Chapter 23 of the City Code entitled Garbage and Refuge to establish new regulations for curbside collection of refuse, recycling, and yard waste. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? Um, I'm going to, through the chair to um, Mr. Vanderpool, if you'd like to answer any of the questions or concerns that the residents brought up. Mr. Vanderpool. Thank you, Mayor. Councilwoman <coughs> Zarco, um, I'll respond. Uh, uh, with respect to individuals who may have a mobility limitation or for one reason or another are not able to get their uh, refuse containers from the curb, or I should say from the house to the curb and back, uh, to their house there is an accommodation that can be made if you want to uh, contact my office city management or call DPW will uh, help you with that and work through that I'll leave you my card and my direct line after the meeting you can feel free to give me a call in the morning we'll get it worked out and then for the uh, individual who asked about special collections furniture couches mattresses uh, that will still be collected. That's part of the program. Uh, that will be coordinated uh, with a separate truck that will come around. Uh, typically, those items will not go in the regular refuse truck, obviously, uh, if it's not in the cart. And in addition, if there's construction debris and the like, unusual items um, that typically are not even picked up currently under our bulk collection program. Uh, let's say you're doing a remodeling, a demo. Uh, there is a service you can coordinate through priority to get uh, that collected as well. Uh, but uh, everything that's under our current program is also provided for in the new program. Uh, so one of the reasons we're moving to the, uh, the new program, a resident mentioned that we do not have any rodent problems and, 
uh, there's no issues uh, whatsoever. Well, that's simply false. Uh, there is a problem in the city, like most large cities, where uh, rodents are attracted to certain areas of the community. And having putrescible waste, wet garbage, uh, sitting on the curbside for sometimes up to 24 hours waiting to be collected uh, does not help the problem. It exacerbates the problem. None of us want that. This is clearly a best practice program. This is done all over the United States uh, in, in Metro Detroit, Shelby, Macomb Township, uh, Clinton Township, City of Warren, and so on. We're not blazing a trail. In fact, we're laggers in this regard in terms of meeting this now uh, best practice. 70% uh, of what goes in your refuse cart can be recycled, in your normal uh, refuse set out, can be recycled. 70%. That's why we're implementing uh, universal curbside recycling. Again, a best practice. We have one of the lowest recycling rates of any city our size in the state of Michigan. We can do better. We are doing better through this program. It's a 10 year program. Um, and there certainly will be some hiccups along the way getting this fully implemented over the next 90 days or so. But when it's all said and done, we'll do it as a community. Again, we're no different than all the communities across the city, most communities across the country that do this every single day, many of whom have the same demographics that we have right here in Sterling Heights. So I'm confident we're going to get there. I've heard a few concerns, but all in all, the vast majority of the community seem to appreciate this program and they're looking forward to it. Uh, so the cart delivery started yesterday. Uh, we expect it'll be all wrapped up this month and the new program starts uh, in May. So we look forward to everyone's cooperation. I'm happy to respond to any further questions. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Vanderpool, I guess if there would be um, some more information I think that has to come up with like a timeline as far as when if you're getting rid of what your container now that was not supplied by GFL how that will be picked up afterwards if you plan to get rid of it that would be something I think residents would want to know um, and I keep saying that for years I sat here and said the same thing that how are senior citizens going to get the cart to you know the curb and now I use the example of my mom's 95 years old and up until three years or two years ago, she was wheeling the cart down there. She loved it. It was better for her to do that. And she has, a, you know, her driveway is really long because she lives in an older home and the, the garage is to the back. So she has a really long driveway. So, and she liked it. In fact, in her community, they gave you two recycling carts and two refuse carts. And even though she was only using one of each, but that's what was supplied for their contract. So this is one of those times that in order for us all to save money, we have to do the same thing. And when you think that we'll be saving about $23 million on this, that we're uh, supplying everybody with a recycling cart because it's attached to a grant that we got that says it has to be universal. Um, it's, it's one of those things that let's see what happens. We're going to try it. We're trying to save money. We're trying to make it easier for everybody. And not experiencing yet what's going to happen, I think that, yeah, you know, we, we should give it some time and, and try it. And it's going to work. But nobody likes change. But it's going to work. Nothing further. All right, Mrs. Schmidt. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, through the chair to Mr. Vanderpool. Mr. Vanderpool, I received a phone call. And just for a point of clarification, we had discussed two weeks ago that if you have a current Sterling Heights GFL trash can that you purchased, you can put the compost stickers on it and use it for compost with priority. Or you can use the paper bags. However, you cannot use the priority waste recycle bin if you are not recycling and put compost stickers on it, correct? Mr. Vanderbilt. 
Thank you, Mayor. Councilman Schmidt, everything you said is correct. Okay. I just want that clarification because I got a phone call and the resident stated that um, he had numerous neighbors that were going to do the same thing. It will not be picked up if it's the priority waste recycle bin with compost stickers on it. It will not be picked up. Mm -hmm. um, so you can use the paper bags or you can use a purchased compost bin from Priority Waste for your compost. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we are one of the last communities to do this. So, um, you know, it, it has to have worked in other communities. We're not the first ones piloting this program. And I just hope everybody can just be patient and work together with us and, and we'll figure this all out. But we're not reinventing the wheel. It's already rolled in many other communities. So we're learning just like you folks are. And I have nothing further. Mr. Ackie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> I agree with my colleague, Mrs. Schmidt. Uh, almost every community that we touch already uses this program. Uh, almost every large city in the state uses this program. Uh, we are, are laggards when it comes to this program. Uh, I wanted to clarify one point that was made by some of the residents here. Uh, Garbage collected with one driver uh, through mechanical means instead of two, that contract was much cheaper. We had them priced the current way that we pick up trash, too. It was significantly more expensive. Mm -hmm. and, and not just a small amount. It was tens of millions of dollars more expensive. Uh, our cost for this contract, which I voted against, I don't like the 10-year program, but the ship has sailed, uh, are significantly cheaper than the next bid, but your price for trash is still going up. The economy is much different for trash now than it was seven years ago or eight years ago when we negotiated the last trash contract, which had tremendous savings in it. It's, it's much more expensive now, and we actually had planned on a much more expensive trash contract than this one. Mrs. Uh, Zarko referred to the $23 million save. That was a savings over the next lowest bid, and we had four bidders. So no matter what you say, we are trying to find the best ground here to save the city money. And just to clarify one more point um, that Mrs. Uh, Schmidt said, all the new trash cans have colors. The refuse cart is hunter green. The recycling bin is blue. If you buy a yard waste cart, it is brown, color coded. If you want to use your old GFL refuse cart that's hunter green and mark it as compost, you can. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, the, the carts are color coded. If you put out a different colored cart, it won't be collected by anything but the truck that it's meant for. So I, I'm sure this is going to work. I'm sure this is just people afraid of change, people afraid of doing something different for the first time in 20 years. But as Mr. Vanderpool stated, we have rodent problems. We do. I get those calls. I think we all get those calls. I almost want to drive around my neighborhood last week and take pictures of all the bags that were shredded by animals. I almost did, just for this very reason, because whenever someone tells me this is not happening, I see examples every week. And that's, that's you know, then that, that, the trash just blows around the neighborhood, and then you get calls from people who are upset about that. So this program is the best. I will commend the city manager. I have concerns about people who have severe mobility issues, but I think we can solve that. I think we're going to solve that. So I, I really do hear you, ma'am. My mother was in a wheelchair, so I, she couldn't have pushed the cart. It wasn't going to happen. So I, I wonder what would something like my mother do? Well, this is my time to talk, ma'am. So I, ma'am, I, I, ma'am, ma you know, please. But, I, but we're going to work with you because I understand. I want to make sure everyone is included. But these are hiccups. We're going to get through this. It's going to be better. Trust me. It's going to be better. And I'm looking forward to it. And then the one final thing I'll say is a lot of people have called and emailed and talked about, well, their association says this or their association says that. We have, we have no control over your association. That's a contractual relationship between you and your association. I personally think associations are communistic. I wouldn't live under one. But if you live under one, it is what it is. But the way to change your association's rules is to petition your association, which you belong to, to change its rules. And I think there's going to be some rule changes because of necessity here. 
but that's upon the residents and their association. The city doesn't get involved in associations. You know, I, I don't want to live under one, so I totally get it. That being said, this is the best program we got. I'm looking forward to rolling this program out and seeing it be successful. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you, Mr. Redke, Mrs. Koski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through the chair to uh, Mr. Vanderpool. The question was asked about the cost of the carts. I recall uh, remembering that there was a grant given for them. Can you? Mr. Vanderpool. Thank you, Mayor. Councilwoman Koski, yes, we received a grant for the program. There's actually two components to the grant that equates to almost a million dollars. So we were able to offset a significant uh, amount of costs with this program uh, with uh, the two grants I referenced uh, for purchase of the carts. Uh, just by way of example, uh, the cost of this program compared to the old program equates to approximately $30 uh, per year, $30 increase uh, per year uh, for this vastly expanded uh, refuse program. So for a $30 increase, uh, you get uh, universal curbside recycling. Uh, you get um, uh, new carts uh, and, and uh, you get weekly uh, recycling collection. Now currently, the recycling uh, program that we have in the city, the curbside program, is subscription-based. Uh, those individuals pay $57 a year for that curbside recycling program. Those individuals will actually see a decrease because they said on average uh, the costs are going up uh, $30. We have 10,000 people who do that. Now that may sound impressive, but when you consider we have 40,000 stops, that's not impressive. Uh, that is very low. Uh, for a city like Sterling Heights, our recycling rate should be much, much higher. And when we talk about sustainability, the drop-off centers were not the answer. Uh, starting up vehicles, driving to these centers that had to be staffed with employees that really were nothing more than glorified dumps is not a best practice in today's day and age. Those people who use the recycling centers, uh, which is good, they no longer have to do that. They simply walk to the end of their driveway with their recyclable goods and every week it's collected. So you can see this is not only a vastly expanded program for the entire city, it's done at an incredibly cost effective rate, uh, much lower than surrounding communities. So we are able to do this methodically, diligently, in a financially prudent manner. Uh, so I'd be happy to go on and on, but I think I've addressed uh, the question. I was asking about the cost of the carts. Well, the costs are, are rolled into the overall program that I just described and the costs thereof. And the grant, let me just correct that, is $1.8 million for the purchase of the cart. So the carts were rolled into the overall programmatic cost. There's not an individual charge uh, for the carts. Okay, to continue on there, if you have a very large family that produces quite a bit of refuge, can you use your old GFL cart for refuge or do you have to buy another cart? And if so, what is the cost of that cart? Uh, Councilman Koski, very good question. So the answer is yes. If you have a current GFL cart, that you purchase, you can keep that cart and you can continue to use it uh, for refuse collection as a second cart. That gives you a lot of capacity. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, 70% of what's thrown away can be recycled. So now you can reduce the volume of your refuse significantly, especially with two carts, if you participate in recycling weekly. Uh, now, if two carts isn't enough and you want to order a third, or perhaps you don't have a current refuse cart, you can purchase a cart. And I believe it's right around $100. I'll have to double check that. I, I can hopefully have you have that uh, for you yet this evening. I just need to check my notes. 
That or you can post it on our website so that uh, any resident check uh, It's can. in our Q&A, but I just need to fix my eyes on it. Thank you. Mrs. Zarko. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, through the chair to uh, Mr. Vanderpool. And this would, I mean, there might be families out there that fill up the one cart, have bags next to it on a, it's habitual. It's like every week. Because there are people now that have two bins. Um, but if this is habitual, would there be a recommendation made to the people that are going to do this all the time rather than it's just on occasion that they would be required to get the second cart through the chair? Uh, Councilman Zarko, yep, yeah, that, that is a very good question as well. So a lot of this is going to require some significant public education. And one of the value-added services of this program is uh, we, we will be able to identify, obviously, uh, those that are setting refuse outside of their cart improperly, uh, not in conformance with our ordinance. We, before we would cite those individuals, we would have numerous conversations. And number one, uh, determining whether or not they recycle. And, and number two, what, what is causing the capacity problem? Is, is there a better way to do it? And number three, strongly encourage them to purchase a second cart. Uh, and by the way, that cost is $110. They can purchase a second cart. Now, mind you, the useful life as the resident pointed out earlier, for these heavy-duty carts are, are many, many years. And if they are damaged by uh, priority waste equipment, <clears throat> they're repaired or replaced. We had no charge to the residents, of course, but there's not a problem with longevity of these carts. Uh, so I, the point of it is when we have those situations, we believe they'll be the exception, not the norm. Uh, especially those who are, we know this from experience, because those who are in the subscription-based uh, recycling uh, program now, there's a strong correlation of them also having purchased a, a normal refuse cart too. Rarely are there capacity issues with refuse carts in those cases because they recycle. When you recycle, your refuse mm -hmm. volume goes down significantly. So it's about public education in those cases. And ultimately, if people have complete disregard for the city ordinance, then, of course, we'll take appropriate action after we've exhausted the actions I just mentioned. All right, Mrs. Sorowski. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. So I'm just going to weigh in very briefly. So we've lived in Sterling Heights for 31 years, and we came from Harper Woods. And back 31 years ago, Harper Woods had their own refuse uh, curbside recycling and their own bins for trash. When we moved here, I, I was like, oh man, I have to buy a trash can and I have to buy, I didn't have even recycling except for when we took it to the recycling centers. So it took this long to get curbside. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I must say as a probably well known by this time tree hugger that I'm excited. I'm excited to have this here. I know that the bins are huge. My 95-year-old mother-in-law in Lansing has a bin this size, one. She, she only needs one. And um, she has to haul it. Actually, it's a bigger bin than what these are. They're, they're really wide um, waste management bins. And they, she, has it haul, she hauls it herself out to the, the curb. And it's, it's big, but it's on wheels. And these, it is very ergonomic. They can, she can get it moving. So just to let you know, it's... It can be done. It's not always easy, but she does it. However, I am very excited to have this for us. For here in Sterling Heights, it makes it wonderful that we can at least do our part. I also bought compostable bags for the first time. See how those are going to go. I hope they actually work and they don't just rip apart, but just saying. It's a start. So thank you, Mayor Taylor. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Sorowski. Anyone else? Not all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item on our agenda is the consent agenda with the omission of E and H. Is there anyone who'd like to speak on any item on tonight's consent agenda? Mr. Smith. Oh, did you say you pulled off item H? Mm -hmm. Yeah, E and H. Okay, well, 
I was talking about items I and H that okay. seem to be related to the same thing. So I'll uh, I'll relate my comments to item I and not H. It's the role. It is not the role of government to be an investor and a speculator in the game of real estate development. Government's role is to be the referee in the game and not a player. Things like Wall Street, Chicago Board of Trade, Las Vegas casinos, Michigan Lotto are run by op operators who manage the gamblers and take a safe percentage. But the operators are smart enough not to play the game themselves because even if the players get lucky at first, they always lose. Sterling Heights is steaming into a huge iceberg. Unlike the Titanic, the city is powering into it in daylight with plenty of time to save itself. The city is crashing 48,162,000 into a $600 million iceberg. But the claimed $600 million is an empty fantasy number, just a number dreamed up by a salesman to sell a bill of goods. The city's $48,162,000 is real money that will vanish. The city council is acting like a hungry fish that can't wait to swallow the bait, just like the millions of people who dump billions of dollars into lottery tickets every week. If this lakeside developer can come up with $62 million, let him come up with the front money too. I get plenty of offers to make $400,000 by letting somebody from Indonesia or, Na or Nigeria, channel $6 million through my bank account. That seems a little fishy to me, so I don't do it. A city council is ready to swallow the same kind of bait. Just say no. There's no business case for the lakeside developer that can't pay it himself. I'm sure that the mayor and city manager would never dump their own money into such a trap. So don't lose ours either. Finally, on that same consent agenda, we got item R, and the city has very belatedly put an end to violence in the world. And, you know, we've been a city for 55 years, and four and a half million people have been killed in wars and violence, and the city council could have ended world violence long ago, and it, it's about time. I'm glad they've done this, and uh, I guess if any of our Palestinian friends are here, uh, they've been preempted, so this this subject has been covered in the consent agenda. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Anyone else on the consent agenda? <laughs> yeah, P and Q. What's the purpose of that? The, the, give them a month. We should have a month for the idiots, too. I don't understand this. And I think the, the Chaldeans and the, uh, they, they, I think they hate each other anyhow, so I don't know what the hell's going on here. And that war one, you should do something about the border if you can. Run down there and help them out. That's it. Mr. Marshall Holmes. Part I have is a question. Uh, what are, is, the, is the city going to do with that $162,000 worth of investment in real property? I don't. Is, is it just something we want to hold and make it more valuable in the future? I'm not sure what that is. Uh, but that's, that's basically the question I have there. The other thing is to adopt a resolution designating the month of April as, oh, I'm sorry, I'm R, to adopt a resolution supporting the end of violent, violent conflicts around the world. We've got the United States Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps trying to do the same thing. The, uh, we've also uh, got the, uh, government organizations, and uh, no, nobody seems to be able to do it. So unless one of you guys are going to pick up a rifle and go do something beside past resolutions, I suggest that you just take that out and forget about it. Quit dreaming. Okay? 
Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, come on up, ma'am, and, and just as a matter of clarity, you can come up, but just as a matter of clarification, I, I want to read what item H is. Item H on the consent agenda is to, a, I'm sorry, item I, to, a, to accept a proposal by Plant Moran Real Point for professional consulting services in connection with financial review and analysis of the Lakeside Mall redevelopment project. This is not investing money in real property. It's a proposal to have professional consulting services in connection with the financial review and analysis of the Lakeside Mall redevelopment project. Go ahead, ma'am. Yeah, good evening, mayor and city council members. Yeah, I appreciate very much um, P and Q in uh, adopting resolution for the Chaldean American Month and the Arab American Heritage Month. They are really says a lot about, uh, you know, what is this city all about, diversity and honoring the diversity of this community. In regard to um, R, the adoption of a resolution supporting an end to violent conflicts around the world. You know, I, th I appreciate the, you adding this to the table. It shows that you are listening to this community. And uh, I would like to think that you have um, empathy towards the people of Gaza who are struggling to survive the shelling and the starvation. Uh, the last six months have been very tough for me personally. It has been very hard every day to listen to the news. And, uh, you know, I'm horrified by the level of the normalization of the war crimes that are committed against the people in Gaza, including killing of the six international food aid workers yesterday. One of them, unfortunately, was a Canadian American, and this is coming close to home. You know, this is basically a message that Nobody, you know, even international people can't go there. People don't want to go there. And this is, you know, basically accomplishes what Israel wants. So um, I can imagine if, uh, you know, uh, you, what would you have done if that, these war crimes were committed in Ukraine? While I'm happy that you have a resolution on the table, it was disappointing that you didn't include Gaza as the place where violence is taking place. Just imagine how it would have sounded if we are in the middle of World War II and you are affirming an end to the violence everywhere in the midst of the Holocaust of, in Nazi Germany. Also imagine how it would have sounded if you are calling for all lives matter in, in the world when there is a full-blown slavery during the Civil War. Just two years ago, you saw the invasion of Ukraine for what it was, and you had this amazing golden halo with the Ukrainian flag colors on Hall Road to honor the victims of Russian invasion, um, you know, the victims of the Russian invasion. <coughs> You divested $700,000 from Russia, and you called Russian activities in Ukraine atrocities. You also fundraised for victims of the Russian invasion. So while there is a full-blown genocide in Gaza, you mentioned the world and dropped the word Gaza from this resolution. While you call for peace, and an end to the violence, you failed to mention a ceasefire. The resolution on the table is a good start. I would kindly request that you add a few words, Gaza and ceasefire. I suggest to add these in the, you know, the script that you have specifically. It's very few words will make a difference. When you say, be it resolved, the members of the Sterling Heights City Council affirm their commitment to an end of violence conflicts worldwide, I would add, including Gaza. You know, simple word. And then in the next one, next paragraph, uh, yeah, where you say... Um, we, we understand. Thank, yeah, thank you, ma'am. 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, hi, everyone. I'd just like to kind of follow up and kind of second what the uh, woman before me said. Um, it's very reaffirming to see that this resolution has been brought forward. Nonetheless, the uh, rather thin um, resolved statement at the end, um, I think, can be improved upon. Uh, not simply just because I have probably many political differences with and desires with people uh, on the uh, council about this issue, uh, it, you know, there's no mention of really the asymmetrical nature of the conflict um, in Gaza and, frankly, which side is killing more of the civilians. Um, there's, I mean, there's, it's thin. It's, it's, it's pretty thin. Um, it, it's just, it's worth reminding again that the um, city made a divestment um, from, um, Russian businesses when the Ukraine war happened. Uh, it's, not, it's not hard to understand and not notice the um, tiptoeing around the issue given that the side that's the greater belligerent after six months uh, is the side that many of our defense industries um, and our government, our defense industries produce weapons for, you know, many people based here in Sterling Heights and Greater Macomb, uh, and that our government is aligned with. Uh, it's worth noting that our government has now stepped up pressure uh, on Israel. They've brought a ceasefire resolution to the uh, United Nations. Um, I think we should follow in their lead and uh, use clear language. I think somewhere uh, language that could be added is the um, denouncing the use of uh, civilians as a uh, pressure tactic to end a war, the killing and slaughtering of civilians. Um, uh, Mayor Taylor, I imagine you and I probably have some disagreements um, about this war. Uh, I know you are surely disgusted by um, the October 7th attack, and um, I agree. I think Hamas made that attack knowing what was going to happen and how they'd be retaliated against and who would end up mostly being killed in the retaliation, but uh, it's also worth noting Israel, they're killing civilians as a pressure tactic to end the war. Uh, they are. It's a terrorism of sorts. So I think uh, pretty, there's language that could be included that could be more explicit about the nature of this conflict and what it is and how awful it is. Um, one that wouldn't uh, just be amenable to many people here in the crowd, but would be amenable to anyone with a conscience and uh, would be um, anyone on either uh, political party would be disgusted by uh, conduct by our government's ally. So thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Anyone else on the consent agenda? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, members of Sterling Heights City Council. Um, I stand before you today alongside fellow community members who have dedicated countless hours advocating for a meaningful resolution regarding the ongoing conflict in Gaza. We are deeply appreciative of the Council's efforts in drafting a resolution addressing the need for um, global peace. However, we must express our disappointment in the vagueness of the current resolution. <clears throat> While the call for world peace is undoubtedly admi admirable, it falls short of the specific action needed to be addressed, uh, that is needed to be addressed in, um, needed to address the urgent humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Our original petition um, and advocacy efforts were centered around urging this, the council to endorse a resolution for a permanent bilateral ceasefire in Gaza and it is crucial that any resolution passed by this council directly addresses the humanitarian situation in Gaza, acknowledging the suffering of innocent civilians and calling for an end to the violence. We understand the complexities of international relations and diplo uh, diplomacy, but we believe that as representatives of our community, you have the responsibility to take a clear stance on these issues. Um, on issues of human rights and peace. By avoiding specific mention of Gaza, Palestine, Israel or the need for a ceasefire, the current resolution misses the opportunity to make a meaningful impact. 
Um, I urge the city council to put forth a resolution affirming our city's support for an end to this violence and to promote humanitarian aid efforts in Gaza by ex including explicit language calling for a permanent bilateral ceasefire in Gaza. Um, thank you so much for your time and consideration. Um, additionally, I wanted to mention um, Miriam uh, wasn't able to be here today. Um, something came up, but she did want me to let you know that she will be emailing uh, a, ceasefire out to, uh, ceasefire um, out to a ceasefire proclamation out to you guys, uh, similar to the one in Ferndale as this uh, ceasefire, the current resolution that you guys have drafted isn't very specific. Um, so anyway, thank you. Yes, sir. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Um, my name is Tom Drobny. I've lived in the city close to 30 years. Um, when I looked at Statement R there, where it wasn't specific, uh, every new month we tend to have some kind of trouble in the world. So we're going to be adding names on to the end of this, of this statement, you know, I think you just probably tried to do a broad umbrella that we're against wars. Uh, I am Ukrainian. I have family in Ukraine. My parents were born there. They came here after World War II. Uh, I speak, read, and write Ukrainian. And uh, if anybody watches the news here, I don't know how much about Ukraine is listed. It's not much more. It's all about Gaza and Israel. I'm not saying that's wrong but there's very little about Ukraine. I have to go to New York Times to read about Ukraine, or I, I, I read the Ukrainian newspapers. I speak with my cousins every week from Ukraine, and uh, they're not having an easy time there. They're slaughtering there. You know, Put Putin's a dictator, and if he takes over Ukraine, he's gonna keep on going to other, other places. So, you know, I'm not against having a separate month for different nationalities. Uh, it didn't offend me that I didn't see Ukraine there. Uh, it what bothers me in today's news that it's barely talked about, like it's all good. It's not good there. And I appreciated that we did the rings in blue and yellow uh, when it, the war started, but you don't see that anywhere. You don't see that support. We have one of the largest cities full of Ukrainians right next door in Warren. Mm -hmm. Very large, one of the largest population of Ukrainians in the United States. Um, I really didn't plan on talking, so I just wanted to get my point across uh, that we also should support them. You don't have to add their name there. Um, I spoke with several of you, and I know your stance on that, and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Right, Could I make a different comment? In, on anything on the consent agenda? I'll talk later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else on the consent agenda? If not, yes, sir, come on up. <clears throat> uh, is there going to be a session after for anything not on the agenda? Yes. Yep. Just wanted to come up here and say that resolution you have produced is... Uh, something, someone who is consciously trying to deny a genocide, a crusade, a holocaust happening in Gaza, out in the open for everyone to see. And if you are not seeing it, you either have lost your conscience or you are intentionally trying to deny a genocide. Thank you. Anyone else on the consent agenda? Mohammed Zaid, resident of Sterling Heights, Demi Falastini. Uh, I have something to share from you uh, or for you, with you guys uh, in regards to the uh, Holy Quran. It's the month of Ramadan, as maybe you know. Um, for the ones that are still questioning or don't know how to perceive a genocide that is taking place on the Holy Land, <laughs> Allah has written. Uh, Allah th hath sealed their hearing and their hearts, and on their eyes there is a covering. Theirs will be an awful doom. With that regards, if you don't make the right choice, <laughs> woe unto you on the day of judgment. And uh, a couple other ideas or uh, statements. 
Uh, Ax My Tax, A X M I T A X. This is to abolish property tax. We're on the consent agenda well, right now. Is, if you, you know, have I anything else to, to talk about on the consent yeah. agenda, you're uh, welcome to. You know, cease, cease fire. Uh, you know, make the right decision. Be remembered for which uh, you would want to be remembered for. Don't make the uh, poor decisions because people will remember for the poor decisions that you decide to make. Thank you. Anyone else under the consent agenda? Uh, since uh, Bruce Houston on Meringue Drive, uh, your consent uh, for the resolution on uh, world peace, I agree with. It's pretty bland because that's about as far as you should go with that. Because there's war from month to month, year to year, and from poor decisions from the very beginning that cause a war, uh, there's consequences in war. Nobody wants war, so don't start a war. And uh, I'm not against uh, anyway, anyone, but um, I'm not for also, I'm not for Israel, I'm not for the Jews, I'm not for the Islam. I'm for America. And I want to see more uh, constitutional stuff going on instead of worrying about the rest <coughs> of the world. Let's worry about our own country. Our country's in terrible shape, and we need help over here. Quit focusing on the other, you know, elsewhere in the world, and uh, let's shore up our own country. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Anybody else under the consent agenda? Council, we need a motion. Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Koski. Move to approve the consent agenda as amended. Support. It's been moved and supported with no discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Next item on our agenda is a consideration item, and this is to receive and approve the Sterling Heights 2040 mission statement, vision statement, guiding principles, and core values. We have a presentation from our chief of police, Dale Dojikowski, our library director, Tammy Turgeon, and our HR and benefits manager, Kate Baldwin. Tammy's on vacation. Well, yeah. you got two of them. You got, the you got next. two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> next best. I just, you know, I just read what's in front of me. <laughs> well, Mayor Whoever Taylor. would like it first. Uh, I'll take it. Um, Mayor Taylor, members of council, thank you very much for having us. Uh, tonight we're proud to announce our Visioning 2040. Um, publicly, we already did so during strategic planning. And tonight we're presenting in front of you, city council members, um, all the hard work that we've put into this process over the last year um, to come up with the Visioning 2040 statement, the mission statement guiding principles. Um, and as you know, uh, Sterling Heights, we did this uh, 10 years ago, and we came out with our Vision 2030 process. And as a uh, young lieutenant here at the police department, I was asked to be part of this group. I think a lot of us at the time, including Mr. Vanderpool, had never done an exercise like this. And it was very interesting, the process from start to finish about what is a vision statement? Why do you need a vision statement? And what's the importance of it? And I think we quickly realized after Visioning 2030 how it became a roadmap for everything that we did in Sterling Heights for the last 10 years. That's how important it, it did become. And that's why we're redoing it as Vision 2040. Um, our Visioning 2030 uh, process, just like 2040, we had input from four big stakeholders, our city officials, community members, city employees, and our business leaders. That helped all create our Visioning 2030 statement and our guiding principles. That then turned into our strategic plan. So we took that guidance as a roadmap. And the strategic plan really dictated our formal plan updates like the road plan, master plan, parks and recreation plan, and outcomes with stability, success, community growth, and best practices. And how do we deliver service to our residents with public safety, DPW, and quality of life issues like our parks and library. The 23 vision statement which I've pretty much memorized from using it a thousand times over, a vibrant, inclusive community for residents and businesses that is safe, active, progressive, and distinctive. Sterling Heights, a bold vision for an exceptional quality of life. 
And I remember fighting over every single word in that vision statement. It wasn't <laughs> just uh, pulled out of a dictionary. Every single word that you see there meant something to the people that did their community groups, our business groups, our elected leaders. We fought for every single one of those words. It meant something in Sterling Heights and it really shows with our, our guiding principles. And they are, our first one, safe, well-maintained, desirable neighborhoods enhanced by great schools. Safety always comes up as one of our number one priorities. Uh, plentiful leisure and recreation opportunities featuring fully utilized parks. Abundant pathways for biking and walking. Focal points that are both public and private to serve as destinations for residents and visitors. Well-maintained and aesthetically pleasing roads and green spaces. Successful, vibrant and attractive commercial centers with unique offerings and destination for high tech and emergency merging industries and entrepreneurs. And as we read through this list now, this was 10 years ago that we came up with this list. And in every single one of those statements, you can see a project, a plan, our Parks and Rec millage, um, everything is embedded in those guiding principles. And that was 10 years ago that this was drafted and it's still so relevant today. Vision 23 successes, again, over the last 10 years, what we're able to accomplish. Massive changes to the Dodge Park area, as you know, our new bridge, the Clinton River was completely cleaned up. People utilize it now on a regular basis, the kayaking and the canoeing. Um, really successful, big, big projects. Um, the Farmer's Market Pavilion, the ice skating rink, the new concert pavilion, the water park. Every time someone visits Sterling Heights, some of my family that I was born and raised in Sterling Heights, and my family comes back for Sterling Fest, they're absolutely blown away at the um, transformation of what occurred here after recreating recreation. Again, bold steps with a plan and a vision, and that's how we got here. Um, updates to all of our buildings. The court is there, the library, city hall, the Department of Public Works, including our own police station, uh, was in really, really bad shape. So all of our buildings got much, much needed uh, facelifts and operational capacity. Again, groups that we never had in the past, our Think Sterling Green Initiative and all the great work they've been doing lately, our African American Coalition that was just started a few years ago, our Community Alliance, better connections with our LGBTQ community, all of this has been part of the process over the last 10 years and a big success. Um, uh, overwhelming um, uh, passing again and uh, renewal of our safe streets uh, millage that helps public safety, police and fire and our roadways and you can see around Sterling mm -hmm. Heights the drastic improvement in our roadways. And simple things um, like our monoliths along Van Dyke. Uh, which are absolutely gorgeous. The um, the landscaping that we put in on Van Dyke and some of our roadways, even our our golden halo, our circle that uh, has become fodder across the state, it is an identifying marker uh, uniquely Sterling Heights. We own it, it's us, this is Sterling Heights. And the possibilities of Lakeside Mall and the future of Lakeside Mall, there's a lot of real estate up there and a lot of great redevelopment um, ideas to come. So with that, I'll turn over to Kate Baldwin. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, Mayor, members of City Council, Mr. Denault and Mr. Vanderpool. It's clear that Visioning 2030 has had an overwhelmingly positive impact on the city over the last 10 years. With 2030 right around the corner, city leadership realized the importance of continuing our momentum as we look ahead to 2040. To facilitate the 2040 visioning process, city administration engaged with Becky Davenport and Ale Herbeck of Strategize to help facilitate the process. We also effectuated a visioning planning team that's depicted here on the slide and a steering team, both teams made up of administrators and employees who helped administer and oversaw the development of the components of the 2040 vision. Throughout this process, we also met with various stakeholder groups, which included our city council and city officials, community members, business leaders, and city employees. A SWOT analysis to identify strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats was developed through data and listening sessions. This included a presentation from SEMCOG providing analytics and trends, listening sessions with city council, the city employees, community members, business leaders, and we also conducted a series of surveys to reach a larger employee and community audience. This research was critical when considering redeveloping the city's overall vision and guiding principles when looking ahead to 2040. Through the Visioning 2040 strategic process and gathering data and feedback, 
we realized that to achieve um, a vision, a mission statement was a necessary step to help support achieving the overall mission. A mission statement defines what we do currently and how we carry out our intentions and objectives. The city practices each and every day innovative living. In innovative living is what we do and is embedded within our intentions, goals, and objectives. This tagline probably sounds familiar as it's one we've used for a few years now. We did think long and hard about whether or not to change this. However, we determined that this is in our DNA. This is what we do. And with that, innovative living is officially coined as our mission statement, which supports our vision for 2040. Hearing from all of the stakeholders involved and taking into account what is important for them, for the continued vibrancy and the future of Sterling Heights, our 2040 visioning statement is an inclusive, vibrant community that is safe, active, and sustainable. And now our chief is going to be reviewing the 24, excuse me, 2040 guiding principles. Thank you, Kate. Uh, moving on to our guiding principles, it came as no shock that uh, when we started ranking everything that's important to people's lives here in Sterling, it's public safety, ended up at the top of that list. Uh, and I take uh, pride in that um, to deliver world-class police services. I know the fire chief feels the same way. Um, and we lead Macomb County in the state of Michigan in so many different initiatives. But uh, public safety, that is equitable, responsive, and proactive. Every word means something. Equitable to me as the police chief means providing services to those who need it the most, those that don't have the biggest voice, handicapped, the elderly, people with substance abuse issues, mental health problems. How do you make sure you provide that service in an equitable fashion? Responsive, when people call 911, they want us there. Not in 10 minutes, they want us there in one minute. And a lot of times we can do that. Um, and proactive, which means catching the bad guy before they do something to you and your family. And we've done that with the, the creation of our directed patrol unit after we close our jail. We're able to add an entire unit of officers that literally floats the city um, pretty much every night looking for bad guys before they victimize you, uh, where you live, where you shop. Um, and it's been highly successful. Sustainability, this was kind of new to our list this year compared to 2030. This came up quite a bit. Um, sustainability, a city that is exceptionally maintained, sustainable, and environmentally responsible. This came up in a lot of our citizen interactions, our business leaders, our community leaders, talked about sustainability a lot, about planting trees and being green, the idea of electrifying uh, our, not only our fleet here in Sterling Heights uh, with our own city vehicles, but around the, the city and the state and the county. Um, community gardens and green spaces, uh, the Think Sterling Green initiatives with our rain barrels, all of this has come to play just recently with a lot of green initiatives, but this was high on the list uh, during our community input. Enriched living, educational and recreational opportunities and programming for all ages, abilities, and interests. And it basically says it right in the title, give something um, for every age to do and every ability in our adaptive recreation programs with Parks and Rec, our library program um, that Tammy does such a great job with uh, educational programming that is offered for all ages, all abilities, and you have to make sure that our, um, our residents have the opportunity to be engaged and get out of the house and do something and have those opportunities available for them. Uh, neighborhoods, this was big. This was a big topic, uh, especially during our community forums. Plentiful and diverse housing and green spaces available for existing and new residents. Um, owning a home is difficult nowadays, and people uh, were very clear about affordable options, whether that's a condo, an apartment. Um, they were uh, very interested in different, unique housing opportunities uh, moving into the future. Not only that, but at the same point, they talked about the want and the need for more open space, green space. We heard people talk about development, overdevelopment, but the ability to leave green spaces where you live um, was brought up multiple times. A connected city, a city engaged with residents and businesses through innovative channels and technology. Um, and connection happens a lot of ways, not only with our water, sewer lines, electrical lines, but connections with our neighbors. <clears throat> and connection uh, takes on a lot of different forms. Tonight's city council meeting, a lot of people are not here in person, but they watch on YouTube because it's easier. Um, and that's the way people want to do it. They want to sit on their couch. They want to engage with city government. And our C-Click Fix program, when people see something wrong or broken in the city, they open up their app. 
staff, they take a picture and we take care of it. Uh, the fire department, the police department, DPW, that is a connected city and our, our residents were very vocal about having the ability to interact with government and our workers here um, and, and make it easier for them to do so. Business innovation, a destination for entrepreneurs, high tech and emergency emerging industries. This is very similar from our 2030 vision statement. And I think we've done that in Sterling Heights. We've become a hub um, for, well, for many years is automotive, but the aerospace industry um, in particular and our Velocity Center, our incubator that we have here in Sterling Heights, we've become a destination for high tech companies that want to move to Sterling Heights and they have been um, over the last decade. Distinctive areas. Uh, vibrant and attractive areas with unique offerings and focal points. Peter K. Giyama, I can't believe I pronounced his name correct. Mm -hmm. uh, he was at our strategic planning session who wrote a book uh, for the love of cities. And he talks about, you know, what makes your city unique? What makes someone feel special when they're in their community? And it might be something like a mural on the side of a building, um, a, uh, a little corner wooded area where they like to take walks or splash pad. These are easy ones. The farmer's market, absolutely gorgeous. They're outside fire pits. You feel like you're some place. It's some place you want to live, you want to walk, you want to bring your kids to. Um, what are those distinctive areas? And if you don't try to build them, they don't happen by themselves. So um, city getting involved and helping these um, definitely helps. Mobility, uh, an accessible city that is connected with a robust system of pathways and trails. Uh, this came up over and over again about the connected pathways. And Sterling Heights has been excellent in adding pathways throughout our city. The Iron Bell Trail connectors to the north end, the south end. We have our first dedicated, one of our first dedicated bike lanes going in on Plumbrook Road. Uh, we've made great strides in making sure that our trails are connected. It gives people a place to bike, walk, and hike. And the city has been excellent at doing this. Mm -hmm. And with the core, that, the core values, Kate. So also through the Visioning 2040 process, we wanted to further expound upon what our DNA makeup would look, would be as we look ahead. Through the research conducted with the stakeholder groups, the words displayed on the screen depict what our core values will be. You'll also notice that some of these words are within the guiding principles that the chief just reviewed. These core values are principles that will serve as a foundation for our culture and the behaviors that we expect from one another. Integrity and an excellence, being honest and going above and beyond, doing the best we can. Sterling Heights is a leader in many areas like placemaking, events, programs, and initiatives, and we strive to deliver that excellence and continue to remain to be a leader. Welcoming, fun, and collaborative, Sterling Heights is a welcoming community to all, of, all, to all ethnicities and diverse cultures while creating various programming and events for our community members to have fun. Being collaborative with community and business members is something we do well in and strive for. Even from an internal perspective as an employee, we foster being a welcoming and inclusive workforce and we collaborate on various initiatives and projects all, we're creating, all while creating uh, an environment that is fun. Proactive and responsive. We pride ourselves, as, as the chief was saying earlier, on being proactive, whether that be through community outreach programs, staying ahead of trends, or supporting infrastructure. We make things happen and take care of the community. If we see something that needs to be addressed, we don't wait for a community member to reach out to us first. We handle it beforehand. Responsiveness is a quality in which we live by. We react quickly and positively when something comes our way. Over our 2040 vision is the foundation for creating an even better Sterling Heights over the next 16 years, a commitment to the mission of innovative living along with carrying out the guiding principles and core values. This will serve to keep Sterling Heights focused on our vision of creating an inclusive, vibrant community that is safe, active, and sustainable. With that, the implementation of the 2040 vision is now here, which will include sharing our 2040 visioning plan using the vision plan to set future goals and objectives and while establishing priorities for those goals and objectives. So this concludes our presentation this evening and we thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you very much, Chief. And thank you, uh, Ms. Baldwin, for your presentations. Um, is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on this item? Mr. Nelson. Ken Nelson, Fire Steel, Sterling Heights. <clears throat> um, 
I still have to bring up every time I go through this and we end up talking about our sustainability and our sustainability commission and we talk about putting up apartments all over the place and we talk about putting community gardens in our parks so that people that live in apartments that don't have any property can go grow corn and whatever they want to whatever they want to do um, this is all great but it's following a plan it's following the plan from the United Nations in fact down here that was shown by uh, Mr. Inks when he first proposed the uh, Sustainability Commission. I want nothing to do with the United Nations, not a thing. The WHO, United Nations, the Econ or World Economic Forum, I want nothing to do with it. This is all about Agenda 2030. Don't like it. All right, thank you, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Smith. Well, it seems like this plan and all other plans before it uh, pays a lot of lip service to bike paths and sidewalks and non-vehicle mobility. But what it always comes down to is putting in redundant and useless paths where they're not needed and ignoring the difficult ones that are really needed. Now, I happen to live on Utica Road. I'll admit that I live on Utica Road, but because of the Clinton River, Utica Road and Clinton River Road are two roads that people have to use to get where they're going, and they have the most glaring absence of sidewalks and bike paths and any other way to go other than drive a car, risk your life walking in the gravel. So, yeah, we, we'll, we'll stripe out a bike path on a street that isn't, that it's already there, yeah. All it costs is, uh, is a little bit of paint to paint a path and see if uh, somebody has enough nerve to ride a bike on Plumbrook just because there's a line. Uh, Warren painted lines on Van Dyke and called them bike paths. You're gonna ride a, a bike down Van Dyke just because there's a green line? I'm sure not. But, uh, you know, if we're going to talk about that, let's do it. Let's, let's get at least one side of Utica Road and Clinton River and Shaner passable without risking your life. Or, or either that or don't brag about it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. I'd like to direct my comments to the, the TV and ask the people that are watching this, uh, come on down here and uh, start defending sure, we, we the Const Constitution. Our rules say you've got to address your comments to the city council. Oh, okay. So you can do that and oh, okay. say whatever you want to say. I just want to invite them down here, that's all. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, I'm a, for the Constitution. I'm for the Bill of Rights, which uh, makes <clears> this uh, uh, United States unique in all the world. And uh, we never put our military underneath a, a foreign government or anything else like that. And, but what's happening nowadays is that you're implementing foreign agendas, whether it's a work, it's all under the, uh, um, the banking system, basically. And you have the World Economic Forum, that's their plans, telling us what to do. You have the UN 2030 agenda, that's what you're following. And um, other agendas, uh, but anyway, but it's, they're not following the Constitution anyway. And it's basically a uh, homegrown way we want to do things and not being a globalist. The globalists uh, are involving us in stuff that we shouldn't be in. And it's our government that's global. You're under the New World Order now, which is run by the globalists. And they're the ones that are financing both sides of wars and everything else that get us in trouble. We have no business, you know, doing that stuff. What's concentrating on home? and not trying to be a globalist country and because uh, we got plenty of problems here we got millions of people on the streets you know that have actually actually you know uh, defended this country and uh, paid taxes and they're just giving it all away our wealth is gone and now you're 
you know, in debt to the central bank, and uh, and you're just going to continue to be in debt to them to do their bidding. So, um, I would like to see uh, our rights reinforced. You know, whether it's the First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, Tenth Amendment, um, that you know will sustain our country into the future. But the way it's going now. We're going to be totally broke and in a depression, you know, very soon. And it's sad to see. I hope everybody's uh, prepared for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anybody else on this item? If not, Council, we need a motion. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Sorowski. Resolved to receive and adopt the 2040 mission statement, vision statement, guiding principles, and core values. Support. It's been moved and supported. Um, Ms. Sorowski, I'll give you the floor, but I, I do want to jump in real quick. Um, I just want to say, I've never read Agenda 2030. I have no idea what that is. I mean, I've heard about it on Facebook for 15 years, mm -hmm. 30 years, whatever. I don't know. I mean, I've been, I've been hearing about it. I don't know what it is. I've never read it. Uh, I don't know anything about the World Economic Forum. I don't know anything about uh, the World Health Organization and how it's implicated by this. Uh, we passed a visioning 2030 statement many years ago. And out of that, we just said, these are our core values. These are our principles that we want to live by. When, 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 we're, when we're passing a budget for our police and fire department, when we're determining you know, how to allocate money to roads, to parks, to the other priorities that we have, what are we going to be guided by? And so none, none of this is against the American Constitution. None of this has anything to do with globalism. None of this has to do with any, you know, one world government or any of that stuff. This is just like when we're determining what are we going to do, how are we going to determine that? What are the values? Because every decision anybody makes, whether it's, you know, where you're going to eat dinner tonight, where you're going to work, how you're going to spend your free time, it's all based on what you value. And so all we're doing is we're saying, these are our values. This is going to inform the decisions we make going forward. And I don't know how this could have anything to do with visioning or with, uh, you know, the, these, these, I'm sorry, but they sound like conspiracy theories. Uh, I don't know any of these conspiracies. So, I, I mean, I don't think our police chief or our, or our human resources director, I don't think the, we, you know, we had residents and business owners and stakeholders come out, you know, regular American citizens, your neighbors. Now, that's where this came from. So I just want to dispel that in case anybody at home is wondering, what the heck does this have to do with the World Economic Forum? I have the same question. Um, you know, when we did Visioning 2030, we heard a lot of that same criticism. And what came out of Visioning 2030? The community center, the farmer's market, the farmer's market pavilion, the ice skating rink, the improvements to all of our parks, you know, the, the initiatives that we've had incredible success in our police department and our fire department, these are all offshoots of Visioning 2030. Okay, so, so if you like public safety and if you like our police officers and if you like hiring new cops, you know, that's Visioning 2030 in practice. So I don't know what the globalists have to do with that. I really don't. Mrs. Sorowski. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. And just as an aside with that, I work for the Catholic Church. I work for the Jesuits, and we have to do mission statements. It's a business practice. It's a general business practice. And we have to do guiding principles. And we do a 10-year projection. And this is what we do. It's every business. So um, it has nothing to do with a globalist philosophy either, especially you know where I work. So on that note, um, I, I am very, I, I, I really like the, the guidelines. Public safety is always something that I am very much in favor of. I think that public safety is a tenant and a hope and what everybody who lives in any community wants more than anything. When I talk to people, both privately and publicly, and as a public servant when going door to door, asking what they want, what do they think, what, what they want to see most in their city, it's always public safety. They want to make sure that they're safe. They want to make sure that we have as many 
firefighters and police officers out there as possible. So obviously that's our guiding, our number one guiding principle. But I like the sustainability part and it has nothing to do with a conspiracy. It is more about making sure that we are protecting what little, it, what little green space is left. My best friend who is the, <laughs> God bless her, the biggest Trump supporter in the entire world. She's a very strong Republican and I love her to death. My parents are Republicans, so we both have, I, I love every view that's out there. And it's a very important to always have wide ranging views and to support every single person. She is the biggest sustainability person out there. So this is not a Democrat Republican issue. This is a community issue. She and I both agree that sustainability is extremely important because we have very little green space left and we need to support green spaces. We need to support environmental responsibility. We need to make sure that what we, little we have left in a city that we don't want to be so urban. I know Mr. Smith, your wife loves her green space next to your, your house. We want to keep that green. We want to keep the bunnies and the, and the squirrels and everything else available for the rest of the residents, not just select few. So that is what we're talking about when we say sustainability. Enriched living, making sure that our housing and, and our, our educational abilities and everything else that we offer to our citizens is available. So these are things that we're talking about. The picture of neighborhoods, another one of our points. That picture that we saw of neighborhoods had multiple housing opportunities. There was an apartment complex, condos, single family dwellings, uh, small little, little houses, all in that picture around a community type uh, park. What an interesting community that would be. So these are things that we are looking at to see what we can do for our community and support. So I'm all in favor of the 2040 guiding principles and our core values, the number one, integrity. Honesty, being open, talking to your citizens. I, if you haven't figured this out about me specifically and, and all of my colleagues out here, we speak our mind, we tell you like it is. I, you know, I support everybody's viewpoint. I, I know that we all are never going to agree on every single thing, but you guys have the right to say it, and I don't care how long it takes. I will always support that. So again, integrity, welcoming, say your mind. Everybody has a different viewpoint, but we are all here to support that. And I'll tell you, Sterling Heights is extremely unique. We are very diverse. We all have different opinions. We all have come from many different places but we are very good at supporting that and being here for each other. So I'll end there, but thank you very much, Mayor Taylor. All right, thank you, Mrs. Sorowski. Uh, Council, anyone else? All right, with no Mr. further. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Thank you. Uh, I guess I wanna add on to what uh, you and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sorowski said. Uh, I attended some of the sessions where we discussed uh, ideas for our visioning 2040, our guiding principles, our vision statement. And I was just so impressed, especially the one attended by the residents. I think there was you know, a full room of residents who divided themselves up into groups and, and picked the things that they cared the most about and brought their ideas to us. So you know, any idea that somehow these ideas were, were pushed on to people is, is belied by the fact that I attended those sessions and the residents talked about what they wanted. And one thing they really did want was to be safe and secure in their homes. I think we all can believe in that, something that Sterling Heights is well known for. Uh, they wanted various housing options. They wanted walkable neighborhoods. And they also wanted sustainability. It was one of the big topics that kept on coming up over and over and over again. And it's not because it comes from some conspiracy theory that somehow some secret organization is changing things. It's because I think people are really um, trying to treat the world a little bit differently. They, they don't want to waste as much. They want to recycle. They want to walk around their neighbors. They want to meet their neighbors. You know, an, a city is made up of, of, of people who want to know their neighbors. They want, it's so isolating to get in a car and drive alone to work every day and eat lunch by yourself in a cubicle and then drive home by yourself yet again, it, it's alienating. And if we can create a community where, you know, like the best, I think one of the best things about living in Sterling Heights is 
You know, when I leave my father's house, I, I walk outside, my neighbors wave at me. I say, hey, hey, Mike, how, how you doing? You know, good to see you. It shows that we're all interconnected. We're in a community. And that's what this visioning statement says. You know, and I'm, I'm so excited to have it here because I think this opens up room for a larger discussion about things that we as a council have been talking about for a long time. I know one priority of many people who've been coming to our meetings for the last several years is open space mm -hmm. and preserving not just any open space, but viable open space that we could turn into future parks or future nature preserve, getting access to this open space too. One of my big regrets on council is that the nature preserve is really inaccessible mm -hmm. to the residents because one thing they're clamoring for, clamoring is green space and the ability to walk around, the ability to see it. And we've talked about this ad nauseum, but I'll bring it up because it's my hobby horse, sidewalks. Now we have a plan right now to fill priority gaps on almost every major road and pathways. And I would like to stop nailing the residents who have lived here the longest, like my father. Twice now my father has paid to improve the sidewalk in front of his house. He had to pay a special assessment, which is a tax, but the tax only comes once every 20 years. So while my neighbors on both sides have moved in and moved out in that time period, my dad, one of the longest, longest, you know, I've been here for 27 years. He's lived here <clears throat> longer than anyone on our block, basically. He has to pay for the sidewalk. Not the person who moved out to my left, not the person who moved out to my right. And that's unfair. We need to figure out a way to bring the sidewalk program in-house and stop charging special assessments. We don't specially assess you a million dollars for the road in front of your house. Why do we especially assess for the sidewalk? People want to walk around to meet their neighbors. It makes no sense. And then we talk about trails and pathways. Every time we bring a path in, uh, up here at the council table, I mean, we just talked about Red Run Park and the improvements we're making there and the grant we just received for Red Run Park. And part of that is going to be a, a tie-in to our 12 miles of trail that we're adding to Sterling Heights. It's going to be a tremendous opportunity for people to walk around, to get out of their house, to experience some nature, because if you walk behind the trail at Freedom Hill, you wouldn't know you're in the city of Sterling Heights. You'd think you're up north because there are deer back there, there are animals, there's water, there aren't cars, there aren't highways, there aren't roads that are about to, cars that are about to come off the road to, to, to hit you. It's a tremendous opportunity. And then finally, we talked about the strategic plan and we need to talk about it more, is the, the idea that we need to retree Sterling Heights. Sterling Heights has one of the lowest tree canopies in the metro area. We estimate we lost 15,000 trees to the emerald ash borer. You know, I was here in Sterling Heights. It took two in front of my dad's house. And we now have heat sinks. We now have runoff problems. We now have drainage issues. You know, our code says that every home that's built in Sterling Heights has to have a, a tree out front. But if you drive through our neighborhoods now, you'll see that there's whole neighborhoods that have one tree or two tree. So I think that like the the parks program that came out of uh, Visioning 2030, which was contentious. Let's be honest here. I voted for the parks program. My dad did not. It passed by 200 votes. But I bet you if we went out there and had a vote today, if the parks are good and we should keep them or go back to how it was before, it would pass with 80% of the vote, 90% of the vote, because people see the value. And I think the residents should trust us. They see the value with what we are doing in the city. I think Sterling Heights has leaped forward because of the 2030 visioning plan, which I had some thoughts about when it was first introduced. I didn't agree with all of it. And I think 2040 really sets the stage. You know, 2030 was the, the base that got us our parks, started us on our pathways, started to really interconnect the city. Because I remember, just to back up a step, we talked about creating a farmer's market in Sterling Heights. Some people, they say it's a junk market. There's no one ever going to attend that thing. There's no one ever going to come to Sterling Heights on Thursday to go to a farmer's market. Now, if you come to Thursdays in the park here in Sterling Heights in the summertime, you will see your neighbors. On some nights, we get more than 10,000 people right here in Dodge Park buying produce, uh, listening to music, having a beer, doing all the things they do while talking to their neighbors. And I, whenever I come on Thursdays, I see my neighbors. I say, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Connections, those things are what bind people to a community. And if we hadn't adopted the parks, parks program, if we hadn't created the Farmer's Market Pavilion, if we had not redone Dodge Park, I guess Dodge Park would still be the sleepy park where kids were getting drunk in the woods, and that was about it. It's been a huge improvement. 
But when we fought about it the last time, a lot of folks said it would never happen because some people cannot have a vision. They don't see the future. They refuse to see the future. They think that we have to live in a cratered hellscape where we don't know anyone and the roads are terrible and the city is awful and it's alienating. I reject all of that. I think that we can live in a city where we know our neighbors, where we have paths and sidewalks and trees, all the things that make a beautiful community. Mr. Mayor, I'm speaking here. Yeah, look, I, I don't know why you guys feel like you can just interrupt us. We don't, we don't talk. It is distracting. I'm just going to say it's distracting when you talk out in the audience. So I'd ask you to you know, extend the same courtesy to us that we do to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, we don't have, I just said, I just said, Mr. Marshall Lones, you're out of order. If there's any more outbursts, then there will be no more opportunity to speak. We are not subject to a four minute time limit. There are seven of us, okay? There are 134,000 residents. There are thousands of business owners. There are thousands more stakeholders, okay? We give you four minutes on each agenda item which is a lot more than most cities. Most cities give you maybe three minutes and you can talk about anything on the agenda, okay? There's, there's enough. Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All that being said, 2030 set, set the stage and I think 2040 can really catapult us into the, what I believe is the number one city in the state. I think people who live here understand that it's a safe city, it's a, it's, a beautiful, I, I honestly think you drive around our area, I don't want to point out any other city. You know, we go above and beyond. We have public art, we have flowers, we take care of the grass. You don't see the dandelions that drive my father up the wall. You know, we are doing everything we can to beautify, to make it sustainable. And 2040's visioning plan will really enable us to go further. So I would really challenge my colleagues. I'd like to see us put an action plan into place for the open space, which residents are clamoring for, for the sidewalks. Let's get that off their backs. I mean, my, res my neighbor across the street literally paid $5,000 for a new sidewalk, and we lowered it. So now it's only $3,000 for a resident out of their pocket. But think about living in the city for 40 years, and you get hit with a bill for five grand for sidewalk in front of your house. It ain't right. We can do better. And then trails and pathways, every time we put a trail in, it's amazing. Every time we put new sidewalk in on a major street, it's amazing. I live on Maple Lane, and we put, a, we put sidewalk in on Maple Lane. It's not done yet. We've got to add some lights and some trees, and we've got to fix it. But I see a ton of residents walking down that sidewalk on Maple Lane every day. They never were there before. I face it. I watch them walk it. And I think, wow, just us putting in a sidewalk from Volpe to 14 Mile has now enabled all these people to get out of their houses and walk around. And if we can do that in, in other places in the city, we're going to connect the city better. We're going to help people who maybe can't drive or won't drive for whatever reason. We're going to let them get around safer because one of the big problems Maple Lane was it had no sidewalk on both sides. A man was killed there riding his bike several years ago. It wasn't safe. This is a safety issue. Sidewalk is a safety issue. And then the pathways just give you more ways to get out of your house and get around and connect where you're not having to use your car. Look, if you want to drive a car, I own a car, we all own cars. We live in Sterling Heights. That's not going to change. But if, if I can get out and walk around and meet my neighbors and get some exercise and enjoy the beautiful city that we all live in, I think we're all winning. So I would challenge my colleagues, let's, let's have city administration put together a plan on how we can make these things happen. Because every time I talk to the residents, they want these things. No one wants to pay a sidewalk assessment. Everyone wants more sidewalk, especially on major streets. I mean, Mr. Smith came up here and talked about Utica. And I know Utica, uh, through the chair to Mr. Vanderpool, Utica is a priority for us to fill the gaps on Utica Road, is it not? I know we've talked about it several times in the past. Mr. Vanderpool. Thank you, Mayor and Councilmember Adke. Yes, it is indeed a priority. We've uh, closed many gaps in the city over uh, recent years. It's been a focal point of what we're doing. And we're making steady progress in other big areas, 14 mile roads. So we have a number of areas uh, targeted across the city. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we just this last year, we did 14 mile from Van Dyke to Marlena, which is halfway to Maple Lane. I'm told that this year we are going to go from Marlena to Shaner, Mr. Vanderpool, through the chair. That's correct. That's correct. Yes. It's, it's amazing what was coming. And then we're going to put in Red Run Park at Moravian and Red Run. We're going to create a brand new park 
for the residents. That's gonna enable them to get out of their houses, to get recreation. It's a tremendous thing, but we need to put together a vision to fund these things, to fund them. Because trees cost money, about $300 a tree. Uh, I know that sidewalk, a five foot square sidewalk costs like $170. You know, uh, open space, I mean, buying land in the city, if you tried to buy any land in the city, you know it's expensive. So we gotta figure out how we're gonna do this because I know what the residents want. I know that this plan shows their wants and we need to enable ourselves and get there for the residents. So I've challenged my colleagues, the city administration, to put together a plan because I want 2040 to be just as successful as 2030 was. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right, council, anyone else? Okay, um, no further discussion. So I guess, let me ask this. I mean, what were you looking for? Do you want to bring that up again during new business? Do you want, I mean, do you, I, I are guess, you looking for it right now? I, I guess I can bring it up right now. Do you like direction, Mr. Vanderpool? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if is, if, is now an okay time? Can we give Mr. Denault, I mean, we're in the middle of an agenda item. Can we give him direction or sure. should that be something that we, you know, oh. on bringing forward a proposal or should that be done during new business? Before you answer, Mr. Radke, go ahead. Can go ahead, I'm sorry. Add? I guess I'm comfortable bringing it forward now or at new business. I guess I would say without objection, I'd like city administration to prepare a plan and a possible uh, ballot initiative to bring forward what our residents are telling us they want. That's our responsibility. Okay, is there any objection to that, I guess, first of all? The only... Mrs. Uh, the only objection I had, I think it should be under new business. Right now we're just approving That's fine. This. I, I, I would I be more off. comfortable if you brought it up under new business. Okay. okay. That's fine. Well, you, because right now it's it what That's we're true. approving is the 24 That's, That's fine. Okay. Statement. All right. We'll bring it up under new business. And, and you know, you've, you've done a good job explaining it already. Okay. Council, anybody else? Any further discussion? No further discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item on the agenda tonight is uh, E from the consent agenda. This is to accept a proposal by Hubble, Roth, and Clark Incorporated. Uh, and by, by the way, thank you, uh, Ms. Baldwin and Mr. Thank you, uh, yes. Chief Dojakowski, and to everyone who worked on the Visioning 2040 uh, plan. Uh, very proud of it, and we're excited to implement it and see where it takes us. So thank you. Uh, so I'm sorry. So uh, this is to accept a proposal by Hubble, Roth, and Clark Incorporated for professional services to complete a comprehensive transportation safety action plan, total cost of $510,000, 80% funded through a Federal Highway Administration grant. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on this item? All right, um, Mr. Radke, you pulled this. I'll give you the floor. Sure. Um, should I make a motion or just? Whatever, if you do, do you have a motion to well, make? Well, let me, let me just talk very briefly and I'll make a motion. Does that sound okay? I, think I don't know if that's well, I wanna, acceptable. Because I want to postpone it, but if I make a postponement motion, there's no discussion on postponement date certain. Okay. Um, Mr. Denault, <laughs> any thoughts on how we, we accomplish this? Seems to me Mr. Mayor, Mr. Radke has expressed his interest in postponement, but I think he'd like to explain why he's about make, to make, make his motion. Make a motion to approve, okay. and I'll support it. Move, move to approve... Uh, Gotta find it. Move, to, move to approve the proposal by Roth, Hubble, Roth, and Clark for professional services. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion, Mr. Yes, Mayor? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that. I, I simply just want to postpone this for two weeks. Uh, there were some questions I had about the proposals. I was told that we would be furnished more information by the administration. Uh, I think that the safety proposal is a good plan, but I wanted to further read and discuss the proposals for the safety plan. So I wanted to, I, I guess I moved to postpone this uh well, hold on okay don't do that yet okay sorry <laughs> um that's wrong. anything else no that's all i have mr mayor okay does anybody have any any issues with a two-week postponement okay go ahead and make your motion okay uh i move to postpone the proposal by hubble roth and clark for professional services to the what is the day the next city council meeting the, the april 16th uh city council meeting Support. It's been moved and supported with no... Uh... Are there two motions on there? Because the first one was just to for the proposal, and now we're doing the postponement. So have to, we have yeah. to either amend the first um, motion to, okay. get, to uh, postpone 
But because we didn't vote on the first one, was well, just for the I proposal. Don't think we, I don't, don't think have we to. have to, but just for the sake of clarity, withdraw your motion. I withdraw it. Uh, withdraw the motion on the floor. I withdraw the motion on the floor. Okay. <coughs> There's no motion on the floor. I'll give you the floor, Mr. I move to postpone uh, discussion on the proposal by Hubble, Roth, and Clark for professional services to complete a comprehensive traffic, comprehensive transportation safety action plan to the April 16th city council meeting. Support. It's been moved and supported. With no discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is... Item H, and this is to, to approve an agreement with the Michigan Economic Development Corporation and sub-agreement with Lakeside OOTB Ventures, LLC, to secure and utilize grant funding for acquisition of real property in connection with the redevelopment of Lakeside Mall. We do have a presentation from our Senior Economic Development Advisor, Luke Bonner. Mr. Bonner. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Mr. Vanderpool, members of Council. Um, thank you for the opportunity to um, talk about this, to talk about the Lakeside Project and what this actually means towards advancing what we've all been waiting for is an eventual um, PUD application to the city for the redevelopment of Lakeside. So I just want to um, take a step back and do a quick review of sort of how we got here this evening and why this is important. Um, this is an important next step. So if we're looking back to November of 2022, uh, when the city council adopted the MOU between uh, Out of the Box Ventures and the city, um, there have been a number of things since then that, um, that we have covered um, as part of that whole process. Um, one of them was creating the Corridor Improvement Authority District, uh, which we did last year. Um, another was uh, looking at state legislation in terms of incentives and the availability of incentives and how that might apply to Lakeside. So we did work uh, with our state legislators on the brownfield laws, um, specifically on transformational brownfield to make sure that Lakeside would be a part of that uh, when it came up. Um, and we also, um, in the MOU, talked about how we would pursue other <coughs> federal and state grants um, as part of the redevelopment project, um, which I'll get to in a second. Um, and then also part of that was, uh, which was another item on consent, was, um, was adding a financial analysis or a financial firm to analyze uh, the Lakeside project and its feasibility before we move forward with um, our, our incentive package. Um, what Lakeside has been doing and why this is a critical component of that uh, Lakeside has um, been negotiating essentially endlessly uh, since November um, on a couple of different fronts. One, they have to have um, permission or sign off from all of the other landowners to submit their PUD application. So that's J.C. Penney's, that's Macy's, uh, that's the owner of Sears. Um, our, and Lord and Taylor um, have to be a part of their PUD application. Um, so they've been, in, been negotiating through that. Um, they've also been, you know, as part of their proposed site plan, um, all of these property owners are connected through what's called a reciprocal easement agreement or an REA. That REA dictates what kind of parking everybody gets. The REA dictates what kind of uses go on at the mall. Um, and so there's been a lot of negotiation with the department stores of what happens to their parking uh, when there's a, a redevelopment and what kind of uses are acceptable. Um, to the department stores when those come when those new uses come through um, and most importantly um, as part of the transformational brownfield application that uh, Lakeside is anticipating to apply for um, they have to have control of the um, over real estate all over all of the real estate at Lakeside in order to apply uh, for those incentives so um, there essentially have been two holdouts um, and this is kind of sort of well known, but uh, Lord and Taylor and the owner of Sears have generally been holdouts. Um, um, it's taken a long time to negotiate them being a part of the PUD application, and it's been taking quite a bit of time to negotiate some kind of uh, acquisition uh, scenario. Um, one of the things that um, we said we would pursue uh, was additional grant funding uh, for the Lakeside Project. Uh, last year, we had um, Representative Shannon approach the city and say, what can we do at the state level uh, to help move Lakeside along? 
um, we identified transformational brownfield was one of them, which I already mentioned. And the second one was, well, uh, we are likely to have um, a couple of holdouts on the real estate side, uh, being Lord and Taylor and Sears, and having any dollars or funding to help assist with the acquisition of those properties would be highly beneficial to moving the project forward. So fast forward to tonight. Um, there was a state appropriation uh, for spe very specifically for a community between 134,000 and 135,000 people that was going to redevelop a shopping center in their community, and it was an economic development grant. Uh, so that appropriation came to the city. Um, our next step is to have a grant agreement between the Michigan Economic Development Corporation and the city for those funds. Um, now, the reality is uh, $3 million um, is not going to move the needle to buy two properties that uh, are likely to transact around $20 million. Um, and first of all, uh, the city, um, we would never recommend that the city purchase these properties, um, and we would never be able to purchase these properties with $3 million. So what we are doing um, through this action is essentially transferring risk of property acquisition to Lakeside. Um, and this $3 million is basically um, a placeholder. Um, it's a large deposit on both uh, Lord and & Taylor and Sears, which would be very atypical of a real estate transaction to have deposits of, of this size. Um, but what this enables them to do um, is get control of Lord and & Taylor and Sears, um, and that will allow them to finally apply uh, for their PUD and will allow them to apply for their transformational brownfield um, incentive with the state of Michigan. Now, the other um, interesting factor here um, is what ends up happening with Macy's. Now, the city has not heard anything from Macy's in terms of it potentially closing, but there was uh, uh, clearly an indication from Macy's overall that they were closing 150 stores nationwide. Uh, and if you read the article, uh, the Lakeside Macy's doesn't fit the description of the kind of store that they're going to keep long term. Mm -hmm. So that's another potential piece of real estate as part of this whole process that needs to be acquired by Lakeside. Um, we know it's public record that Lakeside acquired them all for $26 million. Um, I think it's safe to assume that the purchase of Lord and & Taylor and & Sears is going to be another $20 million, and then you add Macy's on top of that. And the total acquisition of land at this uh, location is going to be upwards of $50 million, uh, which is anywhere five to ten times above what land is actually worth on M59. So there's a significant amount of property acquisition that's going to take place to move this entire project forward. This $3 million is going to be used to put deposits down on two parcels to allow Lakeside to go through our PUD process and go through the incentive application process to get everything um, settled and adopted and approved so that they can move forward with closing on those properties and then eventually um, moving forward with the redevelopment of, of Lakeside. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Bonner. If we have questions, we'll call you back up. Thank you. Um, is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on this item? Mr. Smith? Well, I guess what agenda item is what is a little confusing because this, these number, these letterings don't coincide with what was on television and, and what's on the website. Uh, mm -hmm. I spoke about this during the... Uh, consent agenda, I didn't realize it had been removed, uh, but my position is, is the same, and uh, I don't know, are we, is, is the uh, plant and Moran study, is that no. a separate item, or is that? Separate, separate item on consent that's, agenda. That's yet another separate item? On consent agenda, it already happened. I, I got it, Mike, thank right. you, though. But, uh, um, yeah, what, H was removed from the consent agenda. Mr. Smith, sometimes you, you don't show up right when How do we get from starts. to C? Here, C is, is we about... We take item 8H, and we made it 9C. Okay, very well. Okay, uh, I don't know, kind of a shell game with this, but uh, <laughs> I, it's the only thing that's reality is that the city's going to spend money, and if anything comes back, that's fantasy. That we probably... If you took the, the $3 million and the $45 million and bought state lottery tickets, you'd have a better chance than throwing money down the black hole of Lakeside. You've got 
businesses out there like <clears throat> Sears and Lord and & Taylor and Macy's that are professionals at their business, and they didn't hit so good out there, but you guys are smarter than them, and, and uh, you, you, can, uh, you, you can win just because they lost. You know, in, in Troy, Kmart, which was a pretty smart company, a big company that had stores all over the place, they built a gigantic headquarters in Troy, and then they went broke. <laughs> and then the headquarters sat vacant for a while. Eventually, somebody wanted it, and they tore it down. So that's, that's where we are. Some, someday, somebody's going to want that land, and they're going to tear it down. But uh, you're, you're gambling the people's money on a losing deal. I know Luke Bonner's paid to come up with these schemes, and he's earning his money. He comes up with these schemes. That's what he does, you know, like... Uh, Somebody gets charged with drunk driving, they hire a lawyer, and the lawyer says he wasn't drunk. And you hire Luke Bonner, he says this is a money-making deal, because saying this is a money-making deal is what he does. It's what he does. If he didn't come up with money-making deals, then he wouldn't make his money. But, I mean, I, I've seen salesmen over the years, everybody's got a no-lose deal. And... Uh, you know, the developers of Lakeside, they went in, they made their money, and they moved on, just like the Pontiac Silver Dome and the Palace of Auburn Hills and the Packard plant. That's, that, that goes on, but you can't turn this around, and I don't want you using our money to try, and I don't want you using 162000 of our money to pay Plant and Moran to do a sell job that you guys can't do yourselves. All right, anybody else on this item? If not, council, we need a motion. Mrs. Zarko. Resolve, do you want one and two? Same. Okay, that's what you're getting. Resolve to approve the agreement between the City of Sterling Heights and the Michigan Economic Development Corporation for grant proceeds to fund the acquisition of real property in connection with the redevelopment of Lakeside Mall and authorize the city manager to sign all documents consistent with the approval on behalf of the city and subject to the city attorney review and approval and number two approve the sub grant agreement between the city of Sterling Heights and Lakeside out of the box ventures LLC to allow for use of the grant proceeds to fund the acquisition of real property in connection with the redevelopment of Lakeside Mall and authorize the city manager to sign all documents consistent with this approval on behalf of the city and subject to the city attorney review and approval. Report. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? Mrs. Zarko. Uh, well, uh, well, let me see. I... Since this was pulled by Mr. Radke, let's see what his objections are and then go from there. Okay, Mr. Radke. No problem, Mr. Mayor. I pulled this for several reasons, not because I think that Lakeside is a bad bet, not because I don't want to support the Lakeside project. I guess I'm just incredibly frustrated that we talk about all the needs that we have. We talk about raising revenue for those needs. And instead, we're going to transfer $3 million in a, a public grant that could have gone toward trees or anything else that, that, that uh, State Representative Nate Shannon wanted to use it on, roads, anything else here in Sterling Heights, but instead we're going to transfer it to a private corporation. And I've talked to the city administration about this. I think that we need to have more clarity in what we ask our state legislature, le legislators to do on our behalf. Because in my opinion, there are so many more needs that are a higher priority than than giving Lakeside more money. I support the bond for Lakeside. I supported the MOU. I think that we've made them a very fair deal. But it's idiotic to me to think that these properties did not need to be acquired when they bought them all at a, at a fire sale, $26 million on a $144 million note. And I think that, frankly, it shocks the conscience for them to come back and say, if only we get three more million dollars, we're somehow going to come up with 20 million or 30 million, I guess, if you add Macy's in there, and, and just 10 percent, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make or break us. I think this is just simply they could ask for it, they got it, it's a waste of money. And, the, and I've talked to the city attorney, I talked to Mr. Kashubsky, Mr. Donald is sitting in for him today, and I'm told that this money could be used by the city for other purposes, but the grant is so specific it has to be acquiring property inside the ring road. So I guess 
we have to transfer this money to, to outside the box. So we were given $3 million, but essentially, if we're not going to buy Macy's or buy JCPenney or buy uh, Lord & Taylor or buy, sorry, not just Penny's, buy Sears, uh, we're going to lose the grant. So it's kind of a catch-22, and I, I think it's a real shame. And I'm incredibly frustrated. And I'm frustrated by, by Lakeside uh, outside-the-box development and Lionheart Capital, too, because we signed an MOU, and they said that they're going to bring forward a PUD over a year ago, like 16 months ago. They said it's going to be in the, in, in the container. We're going to be ready to go. And here we are 16 months later. And, you know, and I, I've learned this adage over time that, you know, time kills all deals. And I think that they're killing their deal. And I, I just don't understand it. I really don't. And I, I, I think that they knew going in they needed to acquire Sears. And we told them that. We said, you should go acquire Sears. And they said, well, we're not going to pay what they're offering. We're going to pay less. And what happened? Mario Kezi came in and bought Sears. And now he won't sell it to them for less. You know, this, this is, we are saving a company that for some reason has just taken every dumb decision they can up to this point. And I, I just think, I, I'm frustrated. I'm, this is a message. I, I'm going to vote no. It's probably going to pass, whatever. But $3 million could buy half the trees we need, 7,500 trees. $3 million could go a long way to fixing any number of roads. $3 million would build, it would be about three years worth of sidewalk on our major intersections. So that would be probably 17 mile road, Utica and something else. Money is fungible. And I think it's frustrating that this grant seems, a, it's not fungible. This grant is just a, a straight transfer. And I support Lakeside, I want it to be successful, but man, I am frustrated. So this is me being frustrated. So I'm gonna vote no on this because I think it's a shame that we're gonna take $3 million that we could I guess used to, to acquire something in Lakeside to beautify it or even be a partner to the construction, but instead we're just going to transfer them $3 million. So God bless. All I have, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my thoughts. So as far as I'm aware, uh, there's, there's really only two things for sale inside the ring, mm -hmm. the, the, inside the Lakeside Circle, and that's, that's the old Sears and the Lord and Taylor. Um, and as Mr. Bonner said, uh, we're not going to be able to acquire either of those for $3 million. I've spoken with the um, folks who own Sears. Um, I think that they have a price that's not really realistic. Um, I've spoken with Outside the Box Ventures. I think they have in mind a more realistic price. It remains to be seen exactly where that's going to go. But part of the reason why I'm supporting this is that so first of all, we're not going to get this grant if we don't use it to acquire one of these two properties. And for us to acquire either of the properties, it's going to cost 10 to $12 million or so, you know, let's just say it's going to cost more than five, but less than $15 million to acquire any one of those two properties. So we're not going to spend Sterling Heights taxpayer dollars to do that. So what are our options? Um, you know, if anybody remembers, back when they were building Little Caesars Arena, this is how I think of it at least, if it's helpful. There were all those little lots, little parcels, and the people who sold first, they made a nice chunk of money. The people who sold second, they made more. The people who sold last made a fortune. At the old law firm I worked at 10 years ago, we had a client and they, they got like $2.3 million for a tiny little useless piece of property. Tiny, mm -hmm. and why? Because they held out, they waited and waited and waited. So that's just the, ma the nature of how this goes. Um, so I think, you know, Sears and, and Lord and & Taylor, they probably think, hey, they need this property. We're going to hold out. We're going to get the best price that we can get. Good for them. Um, but the reality is, as Mr. Bonner explained, there are a lot of other state incentives that the Lakeside Mall owners will qualify for, and they'll be able to obtain once they control all of the pieces at the mall. So as again, as Mr. Bonner said, you have the mall, the mall proper, then you have the department stores, which are separately owned. Macy says two, J.C. Penney's, Lord & Taylor, and Sears. So Macy's and J.C. Penney's are on board with the plan right now. They've signed off, as far as I'm, I'm aware. Uh, Sears and Lord & Taylor have not. So in order for Lionheart, 
who owns the mall to move forward with their PUD agreement, they need to control all the parcels there. Once they submit their PUD, they can then go to the state of Michigan and receive a lot of money in grants that they will be entitled to. Um, and with that funding, then they'll be able to go and close on and acquire. So they're gonna put these boxes under contract, then they control them, then after they get the state money, they're gonna go and close on them. So this to me is just the first step in, in a complicated process of acquiring this property. I'm frustrated too. Um, I wish this was moving at a faster pace than it is, but these are very complicated deals. And anybody who's been out there and who's, who's bought a house, you know, there are things that can happen when you're in the house buying process that can cause weeks or months of delays. And that's just for one house. This is for a hundred acres at Hall Road and Shaner with a million and a half square feet of, of of retail already there, some of it closing. You've got dozens of leases inside the mall. You've got these restrictive easement agreements between the various property owners. So it's a complicated deal. We're gonna get through it. And um, and I just, one other point that, you know, again, I you know, I sometimes I hesitate. I, I hesitate to respond things Mr. Smith says, but I, I think it's giving of the wrong impression. Um, you know, I'm not sure what you think is gonna happen at Lakeside, but it's owned by a private company. They are going to demolish the mall. They're gonna completely demolish the mall. Um, they're gonna demolish some, if, if not most, of the department stores. They're going to redevelop it with something that's more in line with what people's shopping habits and living habits and recreational habits are now. So we're, the city of Sterling Heights, it's not like, it's not like we're just, we're, we're not buying this. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna own it. Mm -hmm. A developer is going to develop it. And if, and if there's any doubt as to whether or not there's a market for apartments in Sterling Heights, well, you just have to watch the last three years worth of city council meetings and you'll see. There is, there's a significant market in Sterling Heights for apartments. So I have no doubt that this is going to be a very successful project once all the dominoes fall. So I'm supporting this and I ask my colleagues to support it. I ask you, Mike, Mr. Radke, to support it. I mean, I don't know what a no vote does. Okay. You know, we're not gonna spend it on trees. We're not gonna spend, no, we're not gonna spend it on trees. We're not gonna spend it on roads. We're not gonna spend it on cops or anything else. We can't. Um, okay, council, anybody else want the floor? Go ahead, Barb. Okay, um, thank you. Um, well, here's the thing is, there's one thing, I, I, you know what? I guess I'm not frustrated because I didn't think this was gonna happen the way we thought it was as far as the timeline because of, we were just always moving two steps forward and then five steps back and not because of what we were doing here, it was just, the, what was going on in order to acquire all these properties. Mm -hmm. I think everybody in this room can say we need to redevelop that area because it just can't be a wasteland. Mm -hmm. um, and we do know that it's going to have, a, it's going to have housing, it's going to have a hotel, it's going to have some retail, Hope the medical um, uh, field wants to come in there and, and expand. So it's going to have, a lot of uses. There'll be even small parks there, a walking trail. So it's going to have something for everybody that, and I can see where if you wanted to live there, that's our sustainable neighborhood that we keep talking about. But it's like the mayor said, it's the, the holdouts or it's you're always jockeying for that position and who's gonna do what. Um, so I guess it's like, I knew this was gonna take time. Um, and the other thing is, is as we work through this process between council, administration, and our law firm, we have put in so many guidelines to protect the residents of this community so that they are not using their tax dollars to fund this. We've gone out for grants. We've got, and we still continue to do that. And there's so many moving pieces that eventually, if you just take one step at a time, it 
it'll happen. And it is, it, once we, they can put a deposit down on, on these parcels, then, then they could go and get more money from the state. Um, I'm not aware if there's any federal funding for this, but, but certainly we're gonna look into it. But we're trying to protect the residents as much as we can because we don't want you to pay for it. I don't wanna pay for it. So we've expanded the TIF area so we can bring more money in there. So we've done, we're, it's taking a long time, but we knew it was gonna take a long time. I mean, it's, it's gonna be, I, we thought 12 years, I'm thinking now it's gonna be 15 years by the time we get this thing going. But um, we know that we're being cautious. Um, we're, we're trying to act in your best interest because that will bring in a lot of tax dollars in the future and um, it's more than, I mean, we could probably say that, you know, you're gonna see a decrease in what you might be paying because of what that's bringing in. Or it will give you more amenities in the future. So certainly it's going, it's gonna help us. Um, because it's not giving us any money now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's ridiculous that taxes that are not coming out of there. Um, I guess my only thing I would, uh, through the chair to Mr. Bonner, and I what I mean, we've said we can't spend this on anything else. Do you actually have the verbiage that tells us how this money needs to be sent? Mr. Bonner, uh, thank you. Um, I do, if you want me to read it. Is um, it long? Uh, it's just like any legislation, it's just a little convoluted, um, oh. but I can, I can read it. Um, uh, from the funds appropriated in part one for the economic development grants, <coughs> three million shall be awarded to a city with a population between 134,000 and 134,500, located in a county with a population between 880,000 and 885,000, according to the most recent federal decennial census for the elimination of blight through either acquisition or demolition in relation to the redevelopment of a shopping center. So it pretty much just says... Sterling Heights. That's right. That's what I said. That's Lakeside. the way they, I know. Does it say and Lakeside? you're right. That is the way <laughs> Pretty much a lot of things are so a shopping center, but could it be used in any shopping center in the city? It, it does. Actually, the, the opening section is $3 million for the purchase of property at Lakeside Mall, section 1019, subsection 12. Even so, I mean, it tells us exactly where that money has to go. Correct. So I pretty, we can't use it for anything else. Pretty much. And Correct. I'm certainly not going to turn down $3 million that it took us a while to acquire. And, and, and the other reality, too, is over the time that I've been here, um, the actual grant dollars that have come into the city for economic development purposes, like specifically dedicated for economic development, really hasn't been that much, you know, over the course of the 16 years that I've been working here. We had the EDA grant uh, for Velocity. We have the grant to acquire property and the Corridor Improvement Authority. Uh, which is 850,000, which we're working on a property up there. And really this one are the three that come to mind. It might be maybe missing some, but um, we don't have opportunities to secure economic development grants very often because a lot of times we don't qualify for them. So I think it's, uh, I think it's a bonus that we're actually able to, to get this kind of funding to, for this kind of purpose. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, I know that if you talk to even go into some of the businesses that are in that circle right now, and I can remember talking to the manager of uh, Mission Barbecue, and she was saying, if, you know, in the future, if you know that the people that are working for you are going to be able to live and walk to work, it's a bonus for any business that's there. So, I mean, this is the way uh, some of the businesses in that area are, are, are thinking. Um, and there's other people that are, have been watching this for a while. I, you know, I've said this before to my colleagues that um, there was a time when my daughter had two job offers and one was for the chamber and the other one actually paid more money. And she says, um, I really wanna be with the chamber because I wanna be around for the development of Lakeside Mall. This is, it's like a mission to see that this is accomplished. So um, I appreciate all the work that you've done. I'm certainly gonna vote yes for this. Um, because it's our future. This is our future. And you know, let's, let's bring in some tax dollars in the future. Nothing further. Mrs. Sorowski. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. So thank you, Mrs. Zierko. I did want to reiterate and make sure that we were very clear that this $3 million cannot be used for anything else. It cannot be used for sidewalks. 
It cannot be used for trees. It can only be used for the redevelopment of a shopping center named Lakeside in the grant. So we thank you to uh, Representative Shannon for helping us get this grant, but it cannot be used for anything else. So we have to use it for this. So that is extremely important. It, although I know that um, it has been stated over this evening that it might be objectionable to some because it isn't that that money would hopefully be used for something else, but it absolutely cannot be used for anything else. And that is why it is important to be able to use it for this. So that is all I wanted to say and to be very clear on that so that we know where this money is going. It is not tax dollars. It is a grant specifically given to us to use for this. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Sorowski. Anyone else? Mayor Taylor, Mrs. Schmidt. just real quickly, through the chair to Mr. Bonner. Mr. Bonner, I'm looking at a matrix that we were given. How far off are we from staying on track of that matrix? Um, uh, Councilwoman Schmidt, without um, actually having the matrix in front of me, I don't know. <laughs> um, I apologize for that. And, but but I, I can say that um, I think we're behind schedule in terms of what Lakeside was hoping to do. Would you like to see it? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> and there you go. Okay. Um, so, so we're we're about a year behind. Um, I do. Um, I actually do often use the term that Councilor Rack used. Um, time kills all deals. Um, I teach that actually. I didn't get it from you either. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Um, okay. And that's that's the case in like nine out of ten times, um, but knowing what we have been communicating back and forth with Lakeside, uh, I mean it's weekly if not daily sometimes. Um, the amount of negotiation and renegotiation that they're doing on a regular basis with, you know, all of the department stores essentially to get to this point, um, has been really kind of endless. And uh, I know that it's been frustrating for them in terms of the outcome that they've had in some of those negotiations. And, uh, you know, not to go into inside baseball, but just, just hearing how some of those negotiations have proceeded, you know, have been a little mind boggling. So um, I actually got to give them a lot of credit for keeping the nose to the grindstone and, and continuing to push, push forward and, and move towards the point that we're at today where they're going to be prepared, I would say, conservatively in the next 60 to 90 days to submit their PUD application. And, um, and the amount of work it's, it's taken to get here from a legal standpoint on their end. Um, I often joke, and I mentioned this to Councilman Yanis uh, before the meeting started, it's actually easier to redevelop a landfill, um, which, you know, philosophically you think, well, that doesn't seem right. It's easier to redevelop a landfill than it is to redevelop a mall. Between financial and legal restrictions encumbering malls, um, they're sometimes insurmountable, and it's killed a lot of projects before, uh, a lot of mall redevelopment projects before. But um, I think, you know, with, with tonight's support, I mean, we're getting to, like, a really good spot that we've all been waiting for. So, and then nothing will slow down from there. There's a lot to do, and everything's going to pick up thereafter. Okay, thank you. I, I know, you know, we've been going through this process, and we all thought it was very ambitious timeline and probably mm -hmm. not, um, you know, a realistic timeline. And to be a year behind now um, is understandable because we all predicted it. However, I am glad to hear there's a lot of activity that goes on behind the scenes because we're really not hearing much of it. Um, so I'm glad to hear that. And I, I'm in full support of helping this move forward, and that's what we're doing tonight. So thank you. Mrs. Goski. Thank you. Mr. Bonnard? Yep. Don't go anywhere. Don't you know want better. you to sit down yet. Yeah. Tell me the worst things that could happen. I understand that this money, we found it some, somehow, and I'm going to say Mr. Shannon, Representative Shannon, was the one that came up with the $3, or $3 million to write it specifically for Lakeside Mall because that's what was done. Somebody found the money and they said, give it to Lakeside, correct? Uh, correct, for the purpose of acquisition or demolition. Yeah. Okay, now 
we're going to buy two properties, not us, but out of the box is going to buy two properties. According to our backup material, there is a proposed purchase agreement in there. I'm assuming that's for Sears. The, um, there are negotiating purchase agreements for both Lord and Taylor and Sears. So they're still negotiating. Obviously, they have not been presented with those purchase agreements. They have. They have. Yeah, they've, they've been negotiated. Um, they've been negotiated as far as they'll go um, until tonight's action. Tonight's action will then allow them to move towards the this execution of those purchase agreements. What I'm asking is, we agree to this three million. Are they going to tomorrow then sign those purchase agreements, take them over to the seller and say, sign them? Well, I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow, but it is going to be in the short term. Yeah. So in other words, that is a agreed upon purchase price so far. I think so. Yeah. They're not going to say, well, no, we want to double the price. Uh, I, I don't think so. I think all of the major components of the purchase agreement have been finalized. Um, I think, you know, some small details and then final execution is, is what would occur next. But the basic purchase price is pretty much... Purchase price and general parameters of the purchase okay. agreement. Does this apply to Sears only or Lord & Taylor's also? Both. To both of them? Yes. Okay, so we go through with this. There was a um, conversation earlier that we were going to assist with demolition. Are we also expected to assist uh, their funding or obtaining a grant for demolition also? So demolition will come through um, the Brownfield incentives. That's what Brownfield will be primarily used for, would be demolition, environmental cleanup, et cetera. So that'll, that'll come through tax income and financing. So we don't anticipate, um, currently don't anticipate any other grants <coughs> for demolition, um, but it's not um, like we won't stop, you know, pursuing those as they come up, as the opportunities come up. So explain how Brownfield works. How is that money achieved? So the Brownfield tax income and financing, um, in this case, would be, we call it pay as you go. So as they build and create new value and pay property taxes on that new value, the Brownfield Authority will essentially reimburse them on an annual basis based on the property tax payments. Um, similar to what we've done with uh, Liberty Park and the Ashley Capital redevelopment of that landfill into the Amazon Distribution Center. They create all of the value, they pay their taxes, and through the Brownfield Authority, we reimburse them their taxes for uh, for their eligible activities, it would work the same way here. Okay, so as far as the residents, it's not the residents' money. It would be the taxes generated from the project that Lakeside is building, specific to that project. For the Brownfield? Correct. The three million? No. Three million is the grant that we're talking about tonight. Is the grant? Yep. Yeah. And that's not Sterling Heights money per se. That is money that has been paid to the state. That money is from the state of Michigan, correct. Okay. Is there anything that you can tell us that possibly could go wrong with this? Well, anything could go wrong, <laughs> I suppose. No, um, no the answer is no. <laughs> no, no. No. I, 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 so I, I would also... What I'm I, saying is... Have we put all the safeguards in place to protect this action? So we have safeguards built into the MOU. Um, I, I would consider this, you know, because it's related to a real estate transaction, a real estate transaction has risk. And, um, you know, if we put our, you know, put ourselves in, in this situation. So if it were the city using this grant money, to acquire these properties? What would be the worst case scenario? That we don't close on the properties, right? So that would be the same worst, worst case scenario here is that Lakeside doesn't close on these properties for whatever reason. Um, we don't anticipate that happening. Um, in fact, this is, this is the next step into actually getting them to their PUD application and getting them to Brownfield. 
Um, those are two major components that ultimately, you know, from a loan standpoint, um, triggers a loan to move forward with the development process, and the incentives are part of supporting that loan to redevelop this property. So this is, um, while there's risk with everything when it's related to real estate, um, we certainly didn't want the risk to be on the city. Um, that's why we're transferring the risk to Lakeside to take that on and not the city. So, um, but we've, we've talked about this quite a bit um, on a number of calls that we have with Lakeside and um, they are extremely <laughs> confident about moving towards this next phase and using these funds to do that. And, um, you know, we share their confidence in doing that. Well, I guess my concern, obviously, with my real estate experience, that the seller um, that Lakeside has the financial wherewithal to complete the purchases because if they don't complete the purchase they not only lose their deposit but I understand that there's also a penalty involved uh, I'm not familiar with the penalty I'm sorry Councilwoman Koski. Um, yeah. A million dollar penalty. Mm -hmm. Mr. Million dollar Vanderpool. deposit. Yeah. Uh, count, thank you, Mayor. Councilwoman Koski, uh, just to clarify, if for whatever reason uh, the property is not closed on and uh, they have already, they being out of the box ventures, have already received the $3 million in pursuant to the agreement that you're considering tonight they have to pay the three million dollars back to the state of michigan so that's okay. uh, number one safeguard i think the million dollar penalty you're referring to is there's phases in the draft purchase agreement we can't elaborate too much on it publicly that the purchase price uh, goes up uh, to, if, if they don't close within six month phases the purchase price goes up the longer the phase for a total of one million. But I really can't elaborate too much further on that publicly, but I think I that's the penalty that. that you're referring to. I understand that. Yeah, and thank you, Mr. Vanderpool, in terms of the default provision and the agreement with MEDC, correct? Yeah, I didn't read it as being a default, but I understand it now. That's all the questions I have, thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Yannis. Yeah, so I've been uh, trying to look up to see what Lionheart Capital is valued at. I know they own many, many properties uh, across the United States. I'm fairly sure that if they didn't get the $3 million grant, they would still continue to go ahead and purchase these properties. I think, frankly, and pardon my language, this is a ridiculous use of the people's money. It's not taxpayer money. It's not, it's not taxes, but it is the people's money. And... $3 million could be invested in a number of different ways in economic development. We're just helping boost the bottom line of a private entity, and I'm going to vote no. Thank you. Okay. Um, without any further discussion. One, one, one more thing, Mr. Okay, go Mr. ahead, Mr. Rad. Thank you. One I, more thing. I just wanted to clarify. I am voting against this $3 million because I'm frustrated, but also because I believe that the city should not have asked Representative Shannon for this $3 million. We should have asked for $3 million in some other way, shape, or form. That's why I'm voting no. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, here's what I'm going to say um, in closing, and I guess anybody else can have another shot. $3 million is a lot of money. It's taxpayer money. I feel very strongly in the long-term investment mm -hmm. at Lakeside Mall. Lakeside Mall has a valuation of very little right now. Let's put it that way. And after hundreds of millions of dollars are invested into Lakeside Mall, and again, I have very little doubt that that's going to actually come to fruition. We've seen, I mean, we at 15 and Shaner, there's a $20 million, talk about a landfill, a $20 million or so investment proposed for apartments just at 15 and Shaner. This is going to create a lot of revenue. Now, the TIF is going to take some time to be paid off, but once it is, it's going to generate millions and millions and millions of dollars in annual revenue to the city of Sterling Heights. So 
while it would be nice to have $3 million to go spend that's going to directly impact something right here right now, this is a long-term investment. And I've said it before, if this, city, if this city council had this opportunity 30 years ago, and certainly it did, the city council 30 years ago did things that are paying dividends for us today. So while we're not going to see the immediate impact in our life, in our, in our probably any of our terms, um, it is going to be a huge benefit to residents and taxpayers down the road. So I'm very comfortable with this. It's a long-term investment. It's a transformational thing. And with that, I will ask for a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Barrow. Sarowski? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Yanez? No. Zyarko? Yes. Koski? No. Radke? No. Schmidt? Yes. Okay, motion carries four to three. Um, and we will move on to, thank you, Mr. Bonner. Uh, we will move on to communications from citizens. I imagine you guys didn't all stay here just to watch the Lakeside Mall. Maybe some of you. <laughs> Mr. Smith. It's up front. Okay, on the, you're talking on that yard waste. You get another bucket. Do you still put bags in the bucket, or can you just put it loose in the bucket? Oh, you don't talk. I forgot. Hmm. And uh, let's see. Oh, in this pamphlet here, you got... Uh, you must have under six, six inches diameter. That's pretty damn big. And how do you bundle three or four of them up? You know, can you pick three or four of them up? You can't do it, four foot lengths. But uh, I don't know. We'll see how it works. That's it. All right. Thank you. Who'd like to be next? Okay, Mr. Smith. I've only got four minutes. Uh, usually, can we get a spotlight on that? Yeah. Right. Usually, developers like this can uh, talk all night if they want. But we got a piece of property here. Uh, this was uh, a daycare center. It was supposed to, supposed to be a uh, state-of-the-art daycare center, greatest daycare center ever made. Uh, supposed to be for uh, mothers of auto workers to drop off their kids. But uh, they built it, and the kids didn't come. And somebody who developed it, who thought it was a good idea, got stuck with it. And it became a white elephant. They, they laid it off on the city. And, uh, you know, white elephant's an Indian term for uh, laying off a burden on somebody else that becomes, the gift becomes a burden to the recipient. And Sterling Heights is... Uh, figured out ways to say that they're using this. This is sort of a money pit, but uh, they call it the velocity right now. So anyway, I've developed this, uh, this new use for this. This is, uh, this is called Velocity Towers. And this is a mixed-use development, uh, 600 units, 10 stories high. It includes uh, retail and restaurants on the first floor, uh, professional offices on the second floor, and uh, apartments on the uh, uh, third through 10th floor. We've got a, a green space in the middle, a swimming pool, pickleball, and uh, bocce. Uh, we're uh, repurposing the old uh, Velocity building as a high-end restaurant and business office. Already have uh, parking and landscaping in place. And the, uh, so the Ve Velocity Tower is a mixed-use development. Uh, 600 units averaging $2,000 a month, uh, thereby generating uh, 14,400,000 in annual income. The cost of development is $25 million. So as a payback under two years, it'll bring the city uh, $630,000 in tax revenue, uh, averaging three people per unit. That'll bring in 1,500 people to the head count of Sterling Heights being a big step towards outpopulating Warren and going for the coveted bronze medal. Uh, city uh, 
at no cost to itself can donate this to the developer. Uh, we get, get a mixed use development at no cost to us and it doesn't bust up a neighborhood because it's not, not inter interfering in somebody's neighborhood. Now, better case would if there's two or more developers, we could get a, a, a bidding war like Sears and Lord and Taylor and Lakeside and maybe actually pay the city for this. So, you know, I'm not against mixed-use development. I think it's a great idea, and uh, we need to have it. We just don't want it to bust up established neighborhoods. But this is, uh, this is like the win-win-win deal. We get mixed-use development, tax money, and we get a, uh, a costly white elephant off of our books. Uh, you say, what, what could be wrong with this? Thank you very much. And, you know, and I don't even get paid for this. I, uh, I don't have the use of AutoCAD and Applicon Fisher Graphics anymore. I just uh, did this on my own uh, Google Earth and PowerPoint. So I still got the touch. And, uh, and they've built bigger and better things than this off of my plans, according to every, along with every Pontiac Grandin was ever built. So thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And uh, sharp as ever. <laughs> yes, ma'am. My name is, sorry, I'm not good microphones. My name is Romina Naski. I am the board secretary of the Autumn Summit Society. We currently serve Oakland, Macomb, Wayne, St. Clair, and Washtenaw counties. Soon enough, we'll be serving the entire majority of Michigan. I volunteer on the board because people who have autism need help. And they understand that everyone is unique in their own way. Okay. Everyone has their own characteristics that are different from each other. And I live with autism every day. And for this month, April, which is Autism Acceptance Month, I'd like to challenge everyone here today to work from the rounding step back and open up to everyone to help each other, either with disabilities or not, together to solve the problems that we, everyone has. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank, yeah. thank you very much. We appreciate it. Well done. Well said. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Natsky and I also am autistic. I have autism. I'm here to thank you for passing the resolution proclaiming April Autism Acceptance Month in Sterling Heights. The resolution will bring attention to this month of April and the special activities the Autism Society is holding throughout this time. I'm especially excited to see more people with disabilities like autism Join me in the monthly social at club activities. I made a lot of friendships during them, and I don't feel so alone anymore now that I know that I have a lot of friends and a lot of support. This April, the Autism Society of Greater Detroit is making a list of organizations that are all in for autism. In our state, as part of a national, nationwide acceptance month program, and posting the list on our so social media. The city of Sterling Heights will be a highlight on that list, for being a shining example over the years of how local government can engage and support the inclusion of people like myself and others in all things. Thank you. Great job. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Council, for having me tonight. And I especially want to thank the community that shows up to the meetings. My name is Heather Zielinski. I'm the Executive Director of the Autism Society of Greater Detroit. Our mission is to connect all members of the autistic community with the amazing resources that are available in the state of Michigan. As we help to identify gaps in the resources that are currently available, 
We seek grants as well as partners in the community to help us create solutions. By doing this, we're able to remove the obstacles that stand in the way, help build connections and open doors that may not have otherwise been available. We encourage everyone here today, as well as everyone in the community to get involved with our organization. What we do today will impact far more than just the autistic community that we serve. I would like to invite you to join us as we partner with the Detroit, Lions, or Detroit Tigers, I'm sorry, for Autism Acceptance Month. Um, it'll, it's the second annual day at the ballpark at inclusive event on April 14th. Tickets are available on our website, Autism Society, greaterdetroit.com, as well as on our Facebook page for $20. We're also proud to be able to offer free tickets for anyone with a disability and tickets for only $5 so that they can include their friends and family members as well. I would like to thank you for bringing attention to April as Autism Acceptance Month. By partnering with individuals, businesses, nonprofit organizations, and communities like the City of Sterling Heights, it will allow us to continue to tear down the barriers that stand in the way of allowing autistic individuals and those who love them and allow us all to live life more fully. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, ma'am. Anyone else? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Good evening to everyone, uh, except those who deny genocide. Uh, today I'm here to address those who really care for Sterling Heights, because it seems like people in this room have gone deaf, dumb, and blind. Before I do, I must acknowledge something that, that's commendable that happened in the last meeting. I uh, really didn't catch the gentleman's name, the veteran who showed up uh, in the last meeting, but I must thank him for his courage of showing up and speaking up against the genocide in Palestine. Over the last several weeks, we have experienced an absolute circus in here where bigots are uh, allowed to make racist comments and spread fake news like, like wildfire, while gaslighting residents, if you don't know the term gaslighting, look it up on Google, residents who have lived through generational trauma of illegal occupation, instead of being shut down, those bigots were empowered by the very people that we would expect to represent us. Not only that they were empowered they also empowered those very lies that is allowing this genocide to happen. So today I'd, I have decided to correct those lies for our residents to have a clear conscience and to know, to see through the lies that they are being fed. Before I do that, I must read something out of the Nazi playbook that allowed for a Holocaust that the whole world watched unfold. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic, and or military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its power to repress dissent, for the truth is the mortal enemy to lie. And thus, by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. And that is the very thing that is happening now to this country. So here we go. Here are the seven biggest lie told by the terrorist Zionist state of Israel and their shameless supporters. And you can all go do a simple Google search to verify that these lies have been debunked by credible sources. Lie number one. There was already a ceasefire before October 7. It is a lie. Israel bombed Gaza two weeks before October 7. Lie number two, this war is about eliminating Hamas or freeing the hostages, which is a big fat lie. There are reports of IDF killing their own hostages. And if it was about only Hamas, Israel wouldn't kill and abduct over 1,000 people in West Bank where there was no Hamas. Lie number three, 40 beheaded babies is a lie. Our own president on public television has told this lie and got caught lying, and the White House came out and, and admitted that there was no such proof of beheaded babies. Lie number four, Hamas headquarters under Al-Shifa Hospital, under, after the first siege, Washington Post has reported that Israel failed to produce any credible evidence of a military headquarters under the hospital, and after the second siege to, uh, yesterday, they found 500 doctors, medical workers, and civilians found dead in an execution style after seven-day siege of the hospital. Line number five, Hamas was 
mass raping women. There has not been one report of a, uh, of a rape after October 7th. Line number six, Gaza Gazans voted for Hamas, or Hamas is the elected government of Gaza, so Israel has the right to eliminate all Gazans. The truth is 50% of Gaza's population is under 18 year old, and they had nothing to do with the election in 2006. And lastly, lie number seven, Israel is our ally. There couldn't be a bigger lie than Israel being, uh, being our ally. Throughout the history of this country, Israel has planted spies and even attacked our civilian and military infrastructure when we did not act on their behalf. You can look up USS Liberty incident. Now, I say all of this to say to residents of Sterling Heights, it is time you all wake up to the reality of this country. This country has been infiltrated by a foreign influence that is influencing our country from the very fabric of its social, economic, and political infrastructure. If you don't act now, sorry, it's my. That was my favorite part. Uh, yes, sir. I'm going to respond to that. Uh, yeah, I, no, you no, you no, are no. free. Listen, listen. Everybody here is free to talk about pretty much anything you want. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You are free. I just don't understand for the life of me why the heck anyone would be here at City Hall at 10:05 p.m. on a Tuesday night with about four people watching at home on TV and get into an argument. There, you have Facebook for that. I would recommend you guys can exchange each other's Facebook. You can just go comment after comment after comment. You can be up till four or five in the morning. I'm here because of that kind of stuff. I know. And, and if you want to do it, if I wasn't here, I can't, no one would be saying anything. If you me. want to do it, I can't stop you. I'm going to do it for I one minute. You. I'm going to do a quickie. Okay. Here's what I can tell you. It, it's not moving the needle. Okay. So I know if you want to come up needle. here and do it, go for it. But just with that, with that explanation. I don't want, it's true what he says about Israel. They have infiltrated. They've done bad things to this country. USS Liberty, they bombed it, killed all those people. But Islam's done the same thing with um, Lebanon. And they killed 240 of our uh, servicemen. Blew up a truck bomb. So I'm against us being involved in foreign crap, period. We, we supply both sides. And it has no place here. This is not the forum for foreign bull crap. So they just keep coming in here, keep throwing their crap on us. Take it back to their own country. Go fight in your own war. I don't want nothing to do with it. Simple as that. Same with the Ukraine. We shouldn't have uh, uh, tried to get NATO, NATO in there. We had an agreement, a, a Minsk agreement with Russia not to do that. And so we caused that war over there. So our government's taken over. It's being led by, not by us. That's, I, I, that's all I'm going to say. So... Let's be American first. How about that? All right? Have a good day. All right. Thank you. I'll get you next, sir, in the back, okay? No war, no war talk here. Um, just coming up here, uh, talking about the visioneering plan and, and uh, looking forward to 2040. Um, I commend all of you on the great job you've done since the last 10 years to make Sterling Heights what it is now. It's a great city. Uh, it's a beautiful city. We have a lot of great amenities. Uh, I post a lot of pictures from Dodge Park on Facebook, and I, I have people tell me how I, we wish we had a park like that there. Uh, other uh, amusement things, they say, wow, you got a beautiful city. Uh, my si one sister lives in Troy, the other one in Dearborn. They complement my city more than their own. So it's working. I think you guys are doing a great job. That was one part. My second part, a little bit of critical, is if we can get people to talk closer to this so that we can hear there. When, <laughs> when, I, when I focus in like that, that's to hear. It's not I'm not falling asleep. So okay. you, guys so, are, you guys are doing a great job. Keep I, it up. I appreciate it. I, I don't know if the microphone is weaker today than no, normally. I think some people talk it, no, over here. Yeah, normally people talk yeah. right there, and, and it picks up, and it's... Some, when so you we'll, see me look, you know, trying to focus my ears, I, I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to pick it up. It's been so. quieter today, I think. I, I've uh, noticed it. Keep um, up the great work. Uh, it's, it, the city is great. 
That's all I hear from other people, and I'm talking other states, and I'm talking locally. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. I, Everybody. Thank you. You you can. I I think that that veteran might have short shorted our uh, Maybe. lawyers last time. <laughs> really because the consent agenda was approved, does um, that mean the resolution R has already passed, or is it still being considered? Yes, it's okay. passed. So. Um, I would still encourage the council to um, consider another resolution with a little bit more meat on its bones. Uh, I just want to respond to something, Mayor Taylor, you said a couple weeks ago, because you, you seem to show fair hesitancy to just kind of passing kind of vague resolutions, just calling for peace. Because you posed a question. You said, well, what happens afterwards? And that's actually, that is an important question, um, especially longer and longer this war goes on, and if at all we come to... Uh, a ceasefire situation. So I'd like to just put so forward some ideas to uh, consider in further language. To demand an immediate ceasefire and full commitment to it uh, from both Hamas and the IDF, not only to end the ongoing slaughter of Palestinians, but to prevent the expansion of the war um, to the rest of it is Israel, to the broader Middle East, or to the world. Um, to condemn the intentional slaughtering of people especially as a terroristic and political tactic in the course of war, be it the 1,000 killed by Hamas on October 7th or the 30,000 killed by the IDF since, especially any family members of Sterling Heights citizens. Uh, we condemn the involvement of U.S. defense forces uh, and the U.S. defense industry, especially those based here in Sterling Heights, uh, in these intentional killings. Um, in recognizing the vulnerability and unstable situation of the refugees, um, from Gaza, who have no home re to return to, and the ever-shrinking West Bank uh, due to the settlements that are constantly shrinking the border, uh, what's considered the border, um, the practical impossibility of a contiguous and sovereign Palestinian state at this point in time, um, and the inevitable obligation of the U.S. and by of Israel and by extension the U.S. to uh, rebuild what's been destroyed in Gaza in the wake of the war. Uh, and the need to end this horrid, unstable um, impasse that has gone on for 80 years. We demand, following a swift and permanent ceasefire, the full-throated pursuit of a free and equal society between Israel and Palestine. As such, we demand the full, equal, and unconditional integration of all Palestinians into Israel as full citizens with full rights, not least of all the refugees of the war be it from the Palestinians, the Israelis, us Americans, citizens of Sterling Heights, or the rest of the world, we oppose any and all political, legal, civil, and social opposition, or military opposition, uh, to this integration. Uh, in turn, we support and encourage the, with full enthusiasm to bring about this integration and to bring about a free and equal society. So those are some ideas, I think, that should be considered as a resolution. Um, I just want to say, like, part of the, I am, like, inspired by American history. I think there's, like, a lot to be, a uh, lot to be horrified by, but uh, certainly parts to be proud of and things that need to be pushed on further. Uh, one of the failures of U.S. Reconstruction uh, was to ensure that black Americans were brought into the Union uh, and to the South as full, equal citizens with equal rights. Um, with any luck, uh, the war in uh, Gaza will end soon and not turn into a 20-year conflict like, you know, we saw in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, those people will be able to pursue free lives, and um, I think this is maybe their best path forward to it. So we should uh, push forward a resolution uh, like that and encourage um, higher levels of government, too, as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Mr. Nelson. Over in uh, community relations yesterday, just kind of questioning, there was, after the last meeting, there were a number of people who contacted me and said that all of a sudden, the mic went. The mic went just blank mm -hmm. And uh, while I was talking. Um, apparently, I wasn't given time to finish my thought. Um, but, Mr. Taylor, do you have a mute button back there? Is it you controlling that, or is it downstairs controlling that? 
Um, okay. You can, you can answer it later. I doubt it. Um, that is a form of local censorship, as far as I'm concerned. When people are watching at home, watching this meeting, people that are here, they can hear what's going on. There was a gentleman that uh, got a little out of control, had two police officers come up. It was blank. Nobody knew what was being said to cause that guy, so everybody thought he just went off the, he was trying to get a point across. And there was speech by you. The censorship has got to stop. And uh, I sure would like to see if there's a directive having somebody down there in the control room hitting the, the uh, button, because that's what happened. Um, also, another thing, this is just kind of, I notice you're spending a lot of money bringing community relations up here or down there or something. Is this, was this carpet bought like this? Um, and I noticed, I've seen, I've seen people sitting in this chair and the one behind it and almost falls. They were seniors. Do um, you think you can have somebody bolt that to the floor? Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Nelson. We certainly will. Anyone else under communications from citizens? Can I say one more thing? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in two weeks. <laughs> well, you'll be back. We'll be back. We'll be back in a week or so. Uh, anybody else? Communications? Okay, close that portion. Reports from city administration. Mr. Vanderpool, anything? Nothing further, Mayor. Okay. Um, Mr. Denault, nothing for tonight? I have nothing to add. Thank you. Okay. Council, uh, any new business reports? Mr. Radke, do you want the yes. floor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. It's so hard. I, I felt like I was on a real eloquent uh, tirade, I guess, earlier. Um, but I guess, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, point of order, sir. He's leaving. Okay. He comes every meeting, and it's always the same. The same. Um, okay. Uh, what I was talking about earlier was asking the city, I'm going to ask without objection, asking the city to prepare what they believe from those meetings and from talking with council, action items that we can discuss. I don't know what uh, a ballot question might uh, all include. I don't have the greatest idea. I don't want to just say this, 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 and that. But from what I understood about those conversations, I'd love to hear my colleagues' thoughts were open space, sidewalk and trails, pathways, and trees. And I'd like to have city administration, without objection, bring forward options for us so that we can hopefully propose a 2040 plan for the city, think Sterling Green or something equivalent to it, so that we can move the city forward much like the 2030 plan and the recreation initiative moved the city forward uh, the last time. So without objection, I'd like the city to prepare some options for us because I feel like we have the opportunity here to really reshape the city for the next 15 years, much like the last plan reshaped the city for the last 15 years. Okay, council, anybody have any objection to that? No hearing, comments? Hearing none. Okay. I think, um, you know, I, I think those discussions have already started happening, yeah. and so I think that the administration probably has a, a good idea. Is that fair, Mr. Vanderpool? Yes. Okay. All right, anything else, Mr. Radke? Uh, this is going to be a very busy month. Uh, we have our, our budget meetings coming up. Uh, I always look forward to budget season. It's all about possibilities, and uh, I'm still working through our proposed budget, but I'm looking forward to those meetings and to uh, working with my colleagues to pass another great budget in Sterling Heights. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right, Council, anyone else? Mayor Taylor. Um, last night I had... Um, an opportunity to attend a, an event at the library that was actually orchestrated by the Community Alliance that was called the Page Turner Social. And it was for people that might, you know, they love to read, they want to be in a group that reads, but not necessarily a book club where everybody's reading the same thing. So you had the opportunity to come in, you brought your own book, you read for a while, then you put your book away, 
and then you socialize with other people to get ideas about what they read. They gave you uh, references and recommendations for new authors, new books. It was really a lot of fun. It was well attended, and I really hope that they do it again. But I wanted to thank the Community Alliance for, you know, it, they were thinking out of the box. Um, Mike Mazur, one of the commissioners, is the one that pretty much organized it. He did a great job. Um, and like I said, it was fun. It was fun. So um, just bringing the attention to everybody that in the future, if you think you want to go, it's, it, it's a nice evening to be with other people. Nothing further. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Zarko. Anyone else? Mayor Mr. Taylor, Schreck? just briefly, um, I just want to invite all of the residents to the Police Honor Guard annual pasta fundraiser at Sterling, uh, Penas of Sterling. It is next Thursday, April 11th. Um, there is great food and some usually some entertainment for the kids and amazing raffles. So it's a great opportunity for the community to um, show their support to the Police Honor Guard. Um, they are always there supporting us and, and all of their functions. So um, next uh, next Thursday, April 11th, it's uh, Penas of Sterling. And I have nothing. What time? No, 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 I don't know. <laughs> it's probably on the website. It yeah, it it's on six. the website. Five, six. Yeah, <laughs> five, six, <laughs> fifteen. I, dinner time. <laughs> I guess it's at six. Anyone else? <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Mr. Yanez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to thank my colleagues uh, for supporting and voting for um, uh, the resolution for Autism uh, Acceptance Month. Um, as you saw from our speakers, they did a, a great job. You know, just looking at our 2040 guiding principles, uh, we have enriched living, neighborhoods, connected, distinctive areas, mobility. All of this applies to uh, not only just uh, um, regular citizens, but certainly citizens with special needs. And I think we've done a great job uh, with that so far. Um, our Parks and Recs uh, Department has a great uh, ad adaptive program for uh, people with special needs. So everybody in the city is included. Um, and I look forward um, applying these 2040 visioning uh, principles uh, to our, uh, our, our citizens with those special needs and keep moving forward. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Yanez. Mrs. Koski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through the chair to uh, Mr. Vanderpool, have you heard any more about Fillmore? Is that going to be turned into a center for uh, challenged children and young adults? Mr. Vanderpool. Thank you, Mayor. Councilman Koski, yes, it is going to be. They've started the demo work. We have not seen their actual final plans yet, uh, but they promised to share them with us once they have them. As you know, they're out at the school, the inner, the Macomb Intermediate School District is a legally autonomous, separate governmental agency, so they don't go through the normal site plan review process that all of our other projects do. Uh, but nevertheless, they said that they'd be willing to work with us on uh, certain areas of the development, but it is underway. The demo is um, you know, mostly done now, uh, so they will be starting construction in the near future. And as soon as the plans are available, I know they're going to post them publicly, uh, but I'll share them with city council as well. That would be something nice for us to partnership with and assist them in some of their activities. I'm glad you brought that up because we have a long track record of partnering with the MISD on our special rec programming. And uh, the superintendent has already informed me that he looks forward to continuing that partnership uh, with that facility in and around it. So look forward to more to come. Thank you. All right, anyone else? <clears throat> I would then entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. It's been moved and supported with no discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for coming out and participating. Have a great night. <laughs>